Good morning, everybody. We'd like to call to order the March 20th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. If you could please join us in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, we have a number of revisions on the consent agenda, item number 12. There's an additional, there's additional materials, replacement signature page, attachment A. On item 35, additional materials, a resolution setting the public hearing for various CSAs. On item 38, staff requests that this item be deleted at this time. There's an addenda on the consent agenda, item 42.1. This is to adopt a resolution to consolidate school districts and cities elections with the June 5th, 2018 <coughs> statewide primary election as recommended by the county clerk. There's a board memo. There's resolution consolidating the elections. There's measure P resolution, measure Q resolution, measure R resolution, measure S resolution, measure T resolution, and measure, measure U resolution. And then on the regular agenda, item 46, there's additional materials, uh, revised attachment D. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, wait, there's one more. Um, 47.1 on the regular agenda. This is to consider appointment of Dustin Vereker to the Workforce Development Board as a local business representative for a term to expire June 30th, 2022. Uh, the nomination accepted on March 13th, 2018. That concludes the uh, additions to the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. We'll now begin with the consent agenda. We'll start with the board. Uh, Supervisor Caput, good morning. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, it's uh, several items I'd just like to uh, uh, make comments about item number 12 on the homeless uh, center, the emergency center. Um, there was a reference made to that uh, in the recent article of the city of Santa Cruz budget issues that they're having that the, uh, the, the county's having a tough time chipping in on this. Uh, well, we are chipping in about $100,000, uh, about $25,000 per month. Um, I just wanted to let that be known. And, you know, this, um, this homeless crisis is everywhere. At, um, we show, uh, it's something that uh, we're experiencing here, and, and it's happening throughout the nation too. And I, it's, um, it's. I think it's interesting to know that the uh, the census uh, said that 68 percent of the of those who are homeless uh, were uh, they lost their housing. They were they were residents of Santa Cruz, um, but it's, and also that about 70 percent of them were high school graduates from Santa Cruz uh, City Schools, but it's just that uh, we're doing our part in, uh, in the homeless situation. Um, uh, number um, 26, I just, uh, I think we, I, we, we're all at the Blaine Street reopening for the women's facility there. It's a tremendous addition. Uh, it's going to provide great services for, for uh, women inmates. Um, it's going to be a comfortable setting for them, and I think it's going to allow uh, mid-level uh, inmates to uh, really re 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 rehabilitated and uh, get back on their feet. Um, I just want to compliment the sheriff and everybody in the county for making that happen. Um, I also wanted to say about, on items number 27 and 29, um, these are the, uh, the mobile emergency response team uh, and uh, the, ma the uh, or MERT, and the maintaining ongoing stability through treatment, the MOST team. These are tremendous uh, operations that we have put into place in recent years for uh, emergency re responses for those who need some uh, help um, from mentally ill uh, patients or uh, residents of our area. And Dominican Hospital has been terrific in helping us in this endeavor, uh, contributing over $250,000 in the last uh, couple of fiscal years. I just want to thank them and just thank our health services team for providing those services to those people who, who need it uh, the most. And uh, with that, I think uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you for those comments, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Good morning, everybody. 
Uh, just a couple comments. Uh, first is on item number 29, which is the most team. It does uh, help stabilize, stabilization for uh, folks suffering from mental illness. I just want to congratulate that team for their work. Uh, the outcomes that you're producing are really wonderful for the individuals mm -hmm. and for the community. On item number 30, which is the formerly known as the PAC team, it's now Santa Cruz Hopes team, I want to add additional direction that the Hopes team reach out to the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz about potential client clients and report back on the May 8th meeting uh, with, uh, uh, with the results of that and then also including outcomes that uh, focus on community impacts, meaning arrests uh, and uh, emergency room uh, or ambulance uh, rides. Okay. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, just a couple of items that I'd like to comment on. Um, as uh, was uh, noted uh, by my colleagues, item number 27, which is about our behavioral health mobile emergency response team and the MOST program, uh, I recently had the uh, opportunity to attend the National Association of Counties Conference uh, where they were trying to promote good practices around mental health services. Uh, throughout the country. Um, and as you know, we're part of the Stepping Up initiative uh, that, that is, uh, works to keep uh, the mentally ill out of our jails. Both these strategies were strategies that they recognized as strategies in which counties should be pursuing. So I really appreciate the foresight that, the, the, that uh, this board and our uh, staff has had in cr the creation of these programs. And it was, it was helpful to hear that these are the kind of activities that they're promoting nationwide. Uh, we're using uh, um, sort of best practices when it comes uh, to working and addressing mental health issues in our community. Um, on item number 31, uh, I wanted to ask whether we were going to do a special meeting um, uh, for the cannabis or not. Um, uh, it's still listed here as April 10th, and uh, I thought we were going to try to do April 9th. Uh, I'm, I'm looking over to the CAO. Um, I didn't know whether um, that was a change. Uh, yes, the board asked that we um, discuss that today at this meeting. We did poll the board to ask if they're available on April 9th at 9 a.m. and the board is available. And so it is an option that's available to the board if you wish to change that today. Uh, I, I would uh, recommend that we change the date to April 9th. I understand that as a special meeting we won't be able to take uh, action on an ordinance. Uh, but I think for us to be able to hear testimony and to have conversation uh, will be very useful as, as we've seen with our own past discussions around cannabis and the two meetings that the, the Planning Commission had almost all day meetings, uh, we would be wise to, to do that. So I'll, I'll make that change. Um, the couple other items that I just wanted to comment on, on item 32 and 41, it's uh, both uh, lease and funding uh, to use the, the home on Capitola Road Extension, which is, has, uh, uh, has been the home for the GEMMA services. I'm glad to see that we have a new nonprofit operator, and I hope that can um, achieve its greatest level of success for helping women transition out of jail uh, back into the community. It's an incredibly important resource. Uh, it's one of the n number one things we hear um, for how to ensure that uh, people can successfully reenter the community um, and uh, reduce recidivism is that they have stability in housing when they come out of jail. And I think it's a very worthwhile program. I'm glad to see that we finally um, uh, uh, found an operator for the program. Uh, and last, I just want to, on item number 35, want to recognize the work of our Public Works Department um, and this winter storm update. Uh, I w on my trip to Washington, I also spoke with all of our congressional representatives asking for their help in uh, getting uh, FEMA to follow through on their, um, on their payments to us. We, we're ready to do more work. Uh, we need them to come through with funding. Uh, and I got a lot of support uh, from our members of Congress, but I appreciate the work ongoing uh, to uh, repair the storms from last year. Uh, Chair, uh, Chair, if I could suggest uh, on uh, item 32 regarding the cannabis uh, public hearing. 31. Uh, 32. Um, it's, it's item 31. 31, I believe. Oh. Well. well, it says 31 on our agendas. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, it's 32 on the electronic version, 31 on the paper version. 32. Okay, okay. 32. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we should uh, pull that off the consent and make a separate motion since we are setting a public hearing. Okay, uh, then I would uh, ask that to be pulled. Okay, I'll make that item. We could do it right after this. Uh, yeah. Uh, 43. I'm just going to make sure because there's all these addendas. We'll make it uh, 43.1. Does that work for the clerk? Yes. 43.1. So item 31, ha excuse me, 32 has been pulled to become item 43.1. Any additional comments on? No, I'm going. I won't. I'll all right. stop there. <laughs> Uh, I will briefly speak to just item 35 as well, which is a storm damage update. Uh, recently uh, attended a community meeting in my district with the Assistant Director of Public Works. I'd like to thank Mr. Wiesner for that, um, for attending that, to speak in part on the winter storm update. Uh, with To a person, people were impressed with how much work Public Works has done. They were very understanding uh, about uh, the reality of the timeline and were impressed that some of these major roads that, that really looked to be catastrophic failures were fixed so quickly, and so a lot of times Public Works doesn't hear that feedback from people on the street, uh, but you really do deserve a lot of credit for your leadership on that issue. So we're now gonna open it up to the community on items on consent. This is an opportunity for you to comment on items on consent, which are items six uh, through 43. You'll have three minutes to address us on items on consent. Please feel free to step forward. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Chair, friend, members of the board. I'm Tina Scholl, Assistant City Manager for the City of Santa Cruz, and I wanted to offer brief comments on item 12 pertaining to the River Street Camp. I want to thank you for your consideration of this item and express the City's gratitude for your partnership and participation in the River Street Camp. Um, as you know, it is really taking a step forward in terms of homeless services in our community. The county has been with us all along. I know there was a reference uh, to the newspaper article, but the City really is grateful for the support because not only are you uh, considering participating financially to add another $100,000 in funding to the camp and providing another month of services, but you've already been out there every day. Through your health and human services and through your county public health services, you've been in the camp helping us achieve our goals there. So I really want to say thank you for your support and ask that you do um, um, favorably consider the $100,000 donation to the City of Santa Cruz. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. Um, I would actually like to pull item number. I, your numbers are different than what the public has, and I think it's because there's an item at the end that was supposed, number 42, that was supposed to be put under Health and Human Services, and that may have been inserted. I don't know if that's true, but I want to pull item number. Um, 35 regarding the county service areas. And since you've already pulled that, I'm going to dis another item and going to discuss it right after. I'm hoping you'll do the same for me. Yes, yeah, so 35 is the correct number for CSA. We will do uh, 35 as item 43.2. Okay, thank you. I would like to. Um, also commend the Public Works Department and staff for their excellent response to all the winter storm damage in the county. Um, I see in the documents that there were also improvements and repairs made to Lompico, Nelson Road, and a couple of places in Jarvis Road. So I think that's excellent, especially up in the mountainous areas like that where often people um, don't have many different ways that they can get into and out of, as do the emergency services that serve them. I also want to point out at this time that the county has contracted with uh, various uh, engineering companies outside of the county to do the engineering work to the tune of 15 to $25 million. So I'm sure that's very helpful too and would like to ask that as much inside um, in-house engineering can be done as possible, to, again, to save costs, as was uh, discussed by uh, Director Presley early on in this process. I'd like to um, uh, protest again. <laughs> the use of Measure S funds on item number 37 for the Live Oak Library Annex. This is really a community center with, quote, a small collection of books, end quote. And I think it's a bit deceptive to be using Measure S funds 
um, for a community center with a small collection of books and call it a library. I know it will serve the community well, but I think it's deceptive to use those funds for that purpose. And lastly, I just want to commend um, the continued use of a Measure J house uh, for the uh, Gemma uh, relocation, uh, moving to the new vendor, New Alive Community Services for Transition housing for women coming out of imprisonment. I think that's an excellent use of the housing and hope that it can continue under good management and help these women. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on consent? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Robert Zaremba. I'm here uh, on item number 32. I just want to make this quick and uh, keep it in your guys' uh, memory that... Uh, item 32 was pulled. Oh, you guys pulled that. Assuming so no they were talking about the same item. Yes. Um, the or, cannabis order. Yes. So that, that was pulled and will be considered at the very beginning of the regular agenda in just a, a couple minutes. Okay, here. gotcha. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to address us on consent? <laughs> Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board, recognizing that, that 32 and 35 have been pulled and there's additional direction on item th 30. Is there a motion? Move. Move to, uh, second. Hold on one sec. I, I apologize. You, all right. I, I just had a quick question, uh, Chairman Friend. It does. Is it consent, correct? Uh, yeah. Mr. I, well, I'm, I'm trying to understand the executive session. Is that is that open for consent to comment on? Or is that a different item? Are you talking about the closed session? The closed session. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can. Okay. Uh, so regarding the um, employees review, when it comes to the legal community, right, when it comes to the indigenous uh, defense uh, s uh, system, is there any way that you guys can include them in the performance review? No. I mean, this isn't to get into a back and forth, but we have two employees that are sitting right there. Those are the two that um, will be, that a performance review will be on the CAO and the county council, the district attorney's office, independent elected okay. official. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Alexander. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to address this on consent? Or I'll move it back to the board for action. Move the item as amended. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor Leopold as amended. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Before we take oral communications, we'll move straight into these two pulled items to move forward with them. We first have item 43.1, which is a pulled item 32, which is to set a public hearing uh, for April 9th is the proposed new date uh, regarding uh, consider ordinance amendments to Santa Cruz County chapters 7.128, 13.10, 16.01, and related amendments to the Santa Cruz general plan, uh, local coastal program regarding a cannabis licensing regulatory and land use program for cannabis cultivation, manufacturing, distribution activities as recommended uh, from the planning director. Is there any additional discussion that needs to be had on this? Uh, there was a gentleman from the community that wanted to address us on this item. Now would be the proper time. Thank you for waiting for us procedurally on this. Yeah. I'll try to make this as quick as possible. I just no, want to you know, bring it back up into your attention that uh, this is a pretty serious issue for Santa Cruz County. Uh, we have a very, uh, how would you say, active black market that's been going on in this county. It's been here for a very long time. It's going to stay here for a very long time. And it's pretty much in your guys' hands to, uh, uh, to basically reduce the size of the black market in this county. And the things that you can do is to uh, uh, try to make the, the ordinance as inclusive as possible to draw as many of the players and actors from this industry into an actual regulated market. If you don't make this inclusive, then what you're gonna, end up, you're gonna end up with a much larger black market and you won't have the say over these people such as you know, uh, uh, for a regulated market. You won't be able to tell them best practices and how they should operate. Uh, if this is a very non-inclusive uh, ordinance and you leave many of the people out, then you're just gonna end up with the same problems that you've had and what many of the people in the community have been complaining up to this point, you're gonna continue to have those problems. So I just want to make sure that I keep that fresh in your memories. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us? Again, this is just on the setting of the public hearing that item. Uh, seeing none, we'll move it back to the board for action. Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Leopold, a second from Coonerty. This is to set that public hearing for April 9th. This is the polled item 32. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now we have the second polled item, which is polled item 35. This is pulled by Ms. Steinbrenner. This is adopt resolutions confirming previously approved CPI increases and in benefit assessment rates for various CSAs. To adopt a resolution setting June 12, 2018 as the date for a public hearing on the proposed benefit assessment service charge reports and take related actions as recommended by the director to Public Works, Ms. Steinbrenner, good morning. Thank you, good morning, and thank you for hearing this um, 
now instead of at the very end of the day. I really appreciate it. And because, um, because of that, I chose to take it off to uh, be discussed right now because I am a member of County Service Area 33. Um, and there is a problem in non-payment by the county for a local co paving contractor, Earthworks, that performed the bundled county CSA work in October of 2016. They have still not been paid completely, and this is unacceptable. I have written Public Works, I have come to you, I've come to LAFCO, and still Earthworks, as of Monday morning, had not been paid the remaining $16,000 that are, is due to them. Uh, they have tried to contact Mr. Russ Albrecht. Um, as they understand, it is up to him to sign things off and he is non-responsive. I sent an email to uh, multiple public works H, uh, uh, staff members and uh, received no response. So I'm asking you, when this public hearing comes up in June, I want to be able to come up here and thank you for finally paying Earthworks. They are about the only local contractor that bids on these small jobs, the county service area jobs, even when they're bundled because um, of, of the, the difficulty. And these kinds of things do not help the county service areas get uh, any bids on our projects. It's becoming increasingly difficult. Um, and for that reason, Earthworks may not participate in the bundled project bidding process in the future. That's going to make it very, very difficult for the county service areas to get good competitive bids. So I ask you, again, please um, implore that Public Works completes this payment process for work that has been done in 2016 by Earthworks paving contractors for the county service areas. It affects all of your districts because you have county service areas in all of your districts. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on this item? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring back to the board. I want to move uh, approval of the recommended actions. We have a motion from Leopold, a second from McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on to oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. You have three minutes to address us. Good morning. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, morning Chairman, uh, Supervisors. Um, what I want to comment is the tremendous uh, pressures that's put on the Board of Supervisors in a order to uh, pass alien policies in favor of the multinationals. And what I'm talking about is uh, AstroTurf, in other words, the fake grassroots organizations. Uh, there's two powerful unions that we saw in action across the United States uh, within the last 10 days. Uh, the executive director of the National Education Association said uh, the NAA, uh, the National Education Association, is to be a political power second to none other than specializing in the interest of that group. More and more to say about what teachers, how he's to be educated, uh, whether he should be admitted to the profession, and depending on his behavior, whether he should stay in the profession. We also look at the union members, um, the uh, service employees uh, group. But when we go back and we look at the people that are so-called representing the workers, it ends up they belong to Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission, which is among the most wealthy people in the world, A.W. Abel of the steel workers, uh, Chelkin of the garment workers, Martin Ward of the uh, plumber pipe fitters, uh, Glenn Watts of the communication workers, Jerry Wolf of the uh, uh, Federation State and County and Municipal Employees, Lane Kirkland, I can go on and on. These people are bought out at the very top while the, the workers think that they're being negotiated for. We saw this last week that the uh, state of California is appointing illegal aliens to supervise positions in the state. There is not a job here in this county or in the state that is being protected by the polit politicians and the people that support you. Uh, one of the powerful groups that's uh, out there is a thing called AVOS. Um, it's, uh, some of the people involved in it is Tom, uh, former Congressman Tom Pelliano Jr., um, a pro-war congressman, by the way, progressives. Um, it also included John Podesta. Uh, the first president of the American, uh, uh, the Center for American Progress, 
uh, accused pedophile in Pizzagate. Uh, the Service Employees International Union also helped found uh, VAS. Uh, VAS has 700,000 members in 148 countries. Um, it's supported by millions of dollars from George Soros, who is uh, under criminal indictment in some countries in Europe. Uh, we find also uh, that this team for Avaz includes Andrea Woodhouse, uh, who's a uh, consultant for the World Bank. Um, we have the uh, uh, Soros uh, was a former member of the board of the Council on Foreign Relations, one of the most powerful organizations uh, in the country and in the world. Um, it's funded. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I, I, all right. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address this during oral communications? I'm not sure I got three minutes here. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Kent Washburn. I represent the 5th District on your Housing Commission, your Housing Advisory Commission. We only have a few authorized meetings a year, and uh, every time we meet, there is uh, an increasing sense of urgency among the commissioners uh, about the affordable housing uh, crisis in our society, and especially in this county. We have a mandate uh, under county law to conduct a continuous study of housing issues and housing needs in the county and to report back to you and advise you. You uh, have in your agenda packet, I believe, a, uh, a late ad letter from J.M. Brown, our new chairman. I agree with everything he said uh, in that letter. I'm not going to repeat anything. I have five uh, points to make personally. These weren't voted on by the commission, but I think they represent a consensus of most members. Number one. <clears throat> that we have an emergency. Uh, the people who need affordable housing, uh, we're, following, we're falling farther and farther behind every single day. But we are not treating it like an, an obvious emergency, like a fire, an earthquake, a flood, a drought. But it's every bit as real to these people who are struggling to make ends meet at the low end of our economic ladder. I'm not one of them, but something prompts me to uh, to care about them. Second point, they're not skilled. The people who need this help from you, from us on the commission, from our staff, these people are not skilled at participating in the local political process. They need our help. Third, we need uh, more staff help and funding so that the Housing uh, Advisory Commission potentially can have more meetings. And uh, we rec I would like to recommend that you start the political uh, process by having meetings in each district uh, at which you or senior step members of your staff come to listen to your constituents talk about uh, possible new ideas. And, uh, and then we need, a, uh, we need to consider the fact that current conditions require us to rethink old policies and old ideas that were passed at a very different time in the, uh, in the uh, housing market and in the, uh, in, in the political process and in uh, the development of our economy. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for your service. Good morning and welcome back. Thank you. Good morning again. Becky Steinbrenner from Aptos. I really want to support what Mr. Washburn has just told you. I try to attend these Housing Advisory Commission meetings when I can and find that their members are very um, compassionate and very engaged in what's going on in the, in the community and very concerned. I would like to um, ask that they be allowed to meet more often. I support Mr. Washburn's uh, suggestion that you hold uh, constituent meetings in your, each of your districts. I would also like to ask that the Housing Advisory Commission meetings be recorded so that those who cannot attend them at 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon uh, can, can at least know what's going on. And I would also like to ask that they be required to declare ex parte communication. I have had a sense that there is a lot that goes on in discussion behind the scenes and would like that be transparent. Um, I want to speak with you again about um, uh, your authorization of the um, Measure D paving contracting, uh, one and a half million dollars to the Mountain View contractor, O'Grady. And um, we talked about this last week, but I'm still appalled that your, your board did not take the proper action and rescind those bids so that the process would be 
um, followed properly and legally. And to say that it is immaterial that a contractor did not submit a complete bid and then was contacted and then they submitted what was needed and then awarded the bid, I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's fair and this is Measure D money and you're giving jobs to workers over in Mountain View and I don't think that's fair either when a Watsonville contractor came very close and followed the rules in their bid. I also want to uh, just also say that I was I am still appalled that you, Chairman Friend, led the charge to support SB 623, Senator Monning's water tax, which will, yes, it will um, exempt people with a low income, but those people have to apply for exemption. How many people do you think really will? especially given the, cl the current political climate. It seals from public view all payment of polluters to the state, which is their key to continue to be able to, to uh, pollute and not have any enforcement on their pollution until 2035. And you're supporting this. I'm, I'm still appalled. And finally, uh, Supervisor McPherson, I want to applaud you for your concern about funding county fire. Um, I was at the lessons learned of the Bear Fire and heard you talk about an impending ballot measure to support funding for county fire. I want to remind you yet again, there is $17 million that comes to this county with, S with uh, Proposition 172 and county fire gets none. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Alexander. Welcome back. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my uh, fellow Americans, and good morning, Santa Cruz County. I want to remind us what it is to be good flag-waving Americans, because we are good people. And I want to be able to smile while I do that, because people tell me, smile, Victorious. Um, I, want to be, I want to be able to share my latest books that I'm reading real quick with members of the public, so I can ingratiate myself with them, uh, with members of the public, Religion and the Politics in the United States. Really great book. Right, so I'm reminded as I'm um, fighting for community justice and trying to keep these political agencies accountable as a uh, civil society activist, you know, I find myself getting in trouble because the Mexican is always the usual suspect. I'm always the usual suspect. So when I want to exercise my First Amendment right, they always want to be heavy handed and just mistreat me. I'm talking about these political uh, institutions, whether it's the Sheriff Department, whether it's Scotts Valley Police, and whether it's the, the harassment court. Um, and I want to be able to quote from the Bible, because we're supposed to be a Christian county, right? Because the increase of wickedness, the love of many shall wax cold, uh, Matthew 24, 12. You know, and I, I would want Santa Cruz County not to let your hearts wax cold. Community justice is important. When the DEA is withholding exculpatory evidence to prove my innocence, that's obstructing of justice. And I want to be able to say this. As I was coming here, uh, got so much stuff. I need to get a bigger pulpit. When I was coming here, and this is what I found in Scotts Valley, a plunger. We got three great men up, you know, five great men up here. What we need to do is we need to unclog the political pipes of injustice. And we have to give the American public their due process and equal protection clause and protect them. Hey, the DA is, is withholding exculpatory evidence. Sergeant uh, Fish, he had a body cam. They don't want to present that. I would ask, hey, we stop funding the, uh, the DA's office because I want to be able to show members of the public what I caught at the DA's office just coming up here. I want to show. I caught this right here. Can we see that? It's an illness spreading germ that's affecting the body of politics in Santa Cruz County. This corruption needs to end. Justice is about coming at it right. It's not scamming the American public. God's, God said that he'll, he'll, he chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 1 Corinthians 1 7. Power to the people. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us during oral communications? 
Seeing none, we'll begin our regular agenda, <coughs> which we will start with item number 44, which is a presenta presentation honoring our Public Works Director, John Presley, on his retirement. He said he will spend all of his retirement coming during oral communications to make additional comments. <laughs> Mr. Presley uh, has spent 27 years here with the county and as all of you know has done an outstanding job and I know that uh, board members have been telling me that they wanted to make some initial comments uh, Mr. Presley so we're going to open it up for an opportunity for them to do so. Um, Mr. Coonerty if you wouldn't mind leading it off here. Sure. So I just want to take a moment uh, and appreciate your public service. Uh, there's a lot of uh, denigration of people who work in government uh, these days, but you, through your leadership, through your enthusiasm, your responsiveness, and just true concern for the community, uh, I've seen you come in and out during these storm days where you're going out into the county and really uh, monitoring to make sure our basic infrastructure, what people expect in order to have to get their families safely to and from work or from school or just, just be able to access their neighborhood is, is intact uh, and operating correctly. And I just want to take a moment and thank you for your true, true public service um, and ex a really a model for what, uh, for what we would hope public service would be these thank days. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor uh, Leopold. Thank you. Um, John, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to believe we're at this uh, moment. You have done incredible work here in the county. I first got to know you when you and my wife worked together way back uh, when you were part of the Regional Transportation Commission, which was part of the County Planning Department. Um, you were a great coworker uh, uh, to her, uh, and uh, when I came on board here as a member of the Board of Supervisors, you had just been uh, selected as uh, Director of the Department. And d over the course of the last 10 years, that I've seen you work up close. Uh, you have done outstanding work, and in the last uh, 18 months, you uh, have uh, have um, uh, risen to a, a level that is exemplary for employees. You have uh, been sounding the call about the need for resources for our infrastructure for many years. You have uh, developed a, a triage uh, systems to be able to, ha to to deal with our county roads when we had no resources. And when the uh, Regional Transportation Commission uh, decided to put Measure D on the ballot, uh, you worked with other public works directors to, to just identify that there was a true need out there. Um, the successful passage of that uh, uh, initiative was followed by your advocacy as, ch as chair of the uh, California Engineers Association. President. President, sir. President. Mm -hmm. um, as president, where you led the effort around SB1, which was a long uh, needed um, uh, effort to get the legislature to provide adequate funding for our road system. It took a lot of work. To get two-thirds vote in the legislature means you have to work with your colleagues, which you did, across the state to get them to ensure that their members of the state legislature supported that. So um, then uh, at the same time, we were faced with maybe the biggest uh, uh, damage uh, as caused by a natural disaster in the history of the county. Um, and working with your staff, you worked very hard to get roads open quickly that were severely damaged. And uh, I know you were there the day that we opened um, SoCal San Jose Road. The, uh, all the people that showed up there were incredibly happy something we don't always see around our roads. And uh, it really made a difference in the life in the community because the uh, part of the community was cut off from the rest of the county. So I uh, uh, appreciate uh, all the work that you've done as a director of public works. I appreciate all the work that you've done as, as, uh, uh, as the engineer with the sanitation district, which I've had the pleasure of, of serving on and seeing the, the advances that we made there. And I just appreciate your uh, constant uh, availability to me whenever there were issues um, uh, in the community, you, you were always there to, to help out. So I wish you great uh, happiness and joy in, in your retirement. And I look forward to working with you as my constituent uh, uh, after April 6th. I may run against you. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> 
didn't just really kidding. mean anything I said. <laughs> <laughs> He's a terrible guy. <laughs> Actually, I live in the city, so I, I, I would never want to come back up and do this. He's a great guy. <laughs> well, top that's the best. Yeah, habit. right. Yeah. Go ahead. Go. I'll do uh, 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 Bruce. Yeah, I'll. Uh, yeah, how do you top that one? Yeah, but. Uh, you know, you, you've literally seen it all. I mean, you just came here in the aftermath of the earthquake and have seen floods and fire, some fire damage and uh, droughts that all have a tremendous impact on our public works operation in the county of Santa Cruz. And you've, you've stood up to the plate and really um, done a tremendous job in answering the call. Um, you've seen it all, and it has not been always a great view, uh, I would say, for you. But uh, you know, you, the way you've addressed it, and especially in this last uh, couple of years, with, uh, as was mentioned, Senate Bill 1, the state gas tax bill, uh, you led the charge, and your colleagues um, recognized that. They had a tremendous amount of respect. They do have a uh, tremendous amount um, of respect for you and uh, electing you president of their statewide association. Um, and then with Measure D, which uh, I was co-chair of, uh, we all worked very hard on that. It just wouldn't have happened without your work and your expertise in letting us know how badly we needed this uh, in our um, in our county. I get probably as many calls on transportation as any other subject matter um, in in my office uh, and what goes on. And um, when I call your office, uh, you're always there to answer it. Uh, give me the uh, say. This is the the time frame of what we can do and what we can't do. We've been very limited, but now with with some additional funds from SB1 and Measure D. Well, you've stepped up to the plate, and your method of uh, operation of, of getting some consultants to uh, really uh, multitask so we could get to as many projects as quickly as possible is really to be commended. Uh, people of Santa Cruz County, I don't know how much, uh, I don't know if they know how much they should appreciate you, but you've been phenomenal. I think uh, you're the best of the best. And uh, my congratulations on your retirement. Aloha. I don't know. You got to come <laughs> back here, though, too, to stay here. But uh, you are a tremendous public works director, and I appreciate Thank your you. efforts throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. Yes, uh, we, we have a lot of outstanding uh, department leaders. Uh, of all of them, I would rate you number one. And uh, I want to thank you for everything you've done for uh, my district and the county as, as a whole. Uh, there was going to be a break in the levee, it looked like, on the Pajaro River about a year and a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, your quick work probably prevented flooding in the senior village area, protecting about a thousand homes. Uh, how quick you got on that and uh, how quick uh, work was being done to uh, shore up the levee, it was actually remarkable. And uh, you've worked uh, with Caltrans, uh, helping out District 4, working through paperwork, uh, getting uh, bridge work completed that looked like it wouldn't be done for years, and then also uh, school pedestrian crosswalks and uh, many, many other things. I want to thank you. I'm going to miss you a lot. And uh, I want to wish you the best uh, in your future. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Mr. Palacios. Uh, John, I wanted to thank you for your years of public service, uh, especially for your uh, leadership um, in SB1 and Measure D. And also, as a resident of Watsonville, uh, especially I want to thank you for your years of uh, tireless work uh, advocating uh, for the Pajaro River reconstruction. Uh, you've made great progress in that, and I think that we're at a point, hopefully, in the next few years when we may see some significant progress. So I thank you for your many years of work, especially on, on the Pajaro River. Thank you very much. And I'll speak briefly. Uh, first off, you can use on your campaign mailer Greg's quote that you're his favorite. We'll see how, how that goes <laughs> in the first district. But I just want to say uh, that, John, you've really given your heart to this community. Uh, you've dedicated your professional career, but also your personal life uh, to this community. And you've given your heart to your staff. Your staff absolutely loves you. Um, and you've earned 
that love and respect from your staff because of the way uh, that you treat your staff. And you've, you've given that love and respect to the board and to our constituents. And um, you've given a voice to this community at the state and national level in ways that no previous public works director has ever done. And these things that you and your team do behind the scenes, and I know that your team does a lot of this work because they respect you, and they know that you're gonna be out there in the middle of the night in the same way that they're gonna be out there in the middle of the night. Uh, they know that you're gonna work as hard as them, and your heart is really in what's best uh, for this community. And we are going to miss you as, as not just the public works director, but as a friend of the board, as a friend of the community. Um, and you know, you were nominated um, for, as you know, the Aptos Chamber Community Hero Award. I mean, actually, I wrote the nomination, but still. Uh, and and you were the only one uh, that, that won unanimously of all the people that were uh, all the other uh, nominations for awards. And I think that says a lot about, um, you know, you, although you work behind the scenes, people maybe don't appreciate enough, but do appreciate the work that you do and have done. And the board has a small token of appreciation for you, which is a uh, proclamation that we've all signed. Um, there are a lot of inappropriate things in here, so I'm not gonna read it. Uh, but I think, but I understand, I, I understand they're all true. But we are uh, uh, proclaiming today John Presley Day in the county. You deserve much more than a day because 27 years, I feel like you should uh, get more than a day. You also, though, uh, your staff has also come together for a gift that I'm gonna bring down for you as well and present mm -hmm. to everybody. I think I know what the longer one is. <laughs> Someone paid for that, right? Yeah, this was paid for by staff. Uh, first, there's your proclamation. Second, they call this wrapping paper in public works, apparently. <laughs> it's a set of plans to something I don't think we've built. Really, it's an Aptos project? That's the one you guys chose? <laughs> Unbelievable. Well. Yes, you do. All right. For three minutes. <laughs> That's all I need. Um, I just want to say all this stuff that you talk about, what we've done in Public Works, it really is an outstanding staff. And they're, they're just, they work so hard. Um, Public Works is always pushing the rock up the hill. Sometimes we get the rock over the hill. It's nice. And I think every Public Works director that preceded me always thought we could always make this a better place. And that's what I always tried to do is make it a better place, bring, bring more resources in especially for roads, and I think, I think we're in a lot better shape than we were in the past. Um, SB1 was a big deal, you know, it was a big deal, and uh, put a lot of effort into that across the state, you know, contacting, working with other 57 other um, public works directors as well as working with CSAC staff. That was a big deal, and that's gonna really help this county, um, you know, better its road system out there. Um, the staff, uh, you know, they're just, like you say, they're, it's a great team. Um, we brought in some really good people, and um, unfortunately, we're going to lose one of the better ones with me. Um, <laughs> he's going out April 6th, too, unfortunately. But I just, I think we brought in some good people, and I think there's good people that will continue to carry on what we do in public works and try to do the best job we can. I just want to thank your board. Um, you guys are incredible. I work with a lot of board members, and you know it's always a joy to work with each and every one of you and try and get projects through. It's, um, you know, it's it's been good. So, I spent half my life here, roughly. You know, so I care about the community. Um, I poured my heart and soul into this job. So, thank you very much. It's been it's been great. <laughs> I know that there were members of the community that actually had reached out to me in advance to confirm that they could uh, heap their praise on Director Presley, so if there are some members who would like to briefly come up and, and speak, uh, now would be your opportunity. 
Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, I'm Kay Archer Bowden. Uh, as most of you know, I've been a consultant to the homeowners at Pajaro Dunes for many years and worked with John. Um, he has been fabulous to work with. He was um, generous with his time and unfailingly polite, always professional, even charming sometimes, <laughs> even when he vehemently disagreed with me on things, and sometimes he did. He also knows a lot. He's been here a long time. So it made it easier to work with him because of the history that he had. The other thing I would note about him is that when I'm watching you guys on TV, <laughs> there actually is an audience out there, you know. Um, what really impresses me about John is his fantastic ability to give concise, direct, and informative answers to questions. So often during hearings, all you can do is shout at the TV and say, answer the question. <laughs> Never have to do that with John. And he's always uh, unfailingly polite to the public. I'm just gonna miss him so much. Um, and we'll probably invite him to the next time we have to breach the sandbar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kay. I brought props. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Carol Turley. I represent the homeowners associations at Pajaro Dunes. First, I'd like to strongly recommend that you not accept his resignation. Is that a possibility? <laughs> Is that okay with you? No, I guess not. Okay, well then I'll, I'll have to just um, keep my, my um, comments to thanking John. Um, you haven't always done everything we wanted when we wanted it, but you were always there to help us through processes, to um, hear us when we were scared or concerned or had issues. And for that, I really appreciate you. Um, just to have somebody who, doesn't matter what your problem is, doors open, willing to meet. Um, I think you can leave the county proud of the work that you've done here. Um, so I did a little bit of research on you to find out a little bit about you. Now I want to make sure nobody confuses this with stalking because I don't stalk people, I just do research. So I did find you a, a few appropriate gifts. I know you like to hang out at the beach, so I got you a ball. Can I, um, heads? <laughs> I also found, <clears throat> I also found this kite it's with a, a new picture thing of a board. <laughs> I found this kite with a picture of a five-toed salamander. Now, if anyone ever tells you to go fly a kite, you're prepared. But I want to make sure you don't fly this at Pajaro Dunes because we've been trying to um, make people not believe that five-toed salamanders actually exist, at least not at Pajaro Dunes. So take it to a Santa Cruz beach, okay? <laughs> A jar of flood water, just in case you forget what it's like. <laughs> a jar of beach sand. Do you have an EIR for those things? <laughs> no, please, please. Well, you've got to bring stuff like that up all the time, Zach. Sure. Um, this is a live straw. So if there's, you know, you're out camping and you're not sure if the water quality is very good, you put water in here and you suck up the straw and it takes all the cooties out. But you know, as this is like really cool. As I look at this, I think since we're not going to be able to call you to help with our flood problems, ah! You got another minute. <laughs> um, I might need this more than you're going to need it. So, so I, I might keep that. <laughs> Coffee mug, Pajaro Dunes, a couple of brochures in case you want to come stay with us. <laughs> um, I believe your wife is about a medium, so I got some Pajaro Dunes t-shirts and golf shirts so you can rep us. These are all under $50, John. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just don't report it. it. Just don't like report the it. They're all under 50 bucks. $49.99 worth of gifts. <laughs> Um, postcards, stickers, you know, all that stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Is there anybody else that would like to speak? <laughs> Good morning, Chairman and members of the board. I'm Jane Nguyen from the Health Services Agency. I would like to, your permission, to spend a few minutes to say something to um, Mr. Presley. Hi, John. 
Uh, on behalf of the Health Services Agency, I want to say thank you so very much for the partnership throughout the years. You work really closely with us to help open up the Behavioral Health Unit. Um, you and Bessie were very instrumental in helping us lift that uh, very heavy way, so we want to thank you. Your contribution really has helped this community to secure 16-bed inpatient psychiatric health facility for our residents here, and that is tremendous. We want to thank you for that. Also, throughout the years, your department and my department have been partnering on several important grants, the Caltrans Transportation Grants. Because of your work, your leadership, and your staff help, we secure quite a few grants over the years to help our community. And also your leadership was recognized recently last week um, at CSAC um, seminar in San Jose. Um, I was asked to speak to 53 potential department heads throughout the states. And during that uh, conversation I had with those 53 candidates, they all talked about you and how famous, famous you are statewide uh, of the work you've done at the engineer association level. So I want to say thank you so much for your work and I really appreciate your leadership, your kindness, your professionalism. You're humble but you're very smart and you know what you're doing. So thanks again for all your help. Thank you, board. Thank you. Good morning. First of all, I want to commend all of you board members for um, saying everything that I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's all definitely true. But I do want to say that I've had the pleasure of working for, John is my fourth public works director in this county that I've worked for, and he's had very big shoes to fill and he has definitely filled them without question. In fact, he's more than filled them. And his retirement will bring a very big loss, not only to the department, but also to the county, as some of you have already said. And we will miss him greatly. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to address us on this item? Kathy Malloy, um, Planning Director, and I also want to thank John, I'll be brief, for your partnership. Um, as a, an example of that, I'll just say that when I first came here, I, I heard that there had been some talk of, of putting a wall up between uh, the, the one connection between the Planning and Public Works Department. We're both on the same floor. Uh, but rather than pursue that wall, we actually created a second opening. And you know that's a good symbol for the partnership and really trying to view ourselves as a unified development services center that, that we're not siloed, we're not two separate departments, we have the same objective. And um, you and your staff have been great partners in, in that effort and really wish you happiness and health and fun times in your retirement. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to address us on the item? The board actually needs to take action on that proclamation because all of us signed it. I move approval. <laughs> we have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from second. Supervisor, a second and third and fourth from the rest of the board from what I can gather. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. There will be a reception that Public Works is putting on on the, on the fourth floor uh, in their offices immediately following this presentation. John, um, our hearts are with you in your retirement. Uh, we're going to miss you greatly. Uh, thank you for your 27 years of remarkable service. Please do give him the hand that he deserves. <laughs> Continue on to item 45, which is a presentation recognizing the recipients of the Women's Commission Trailblazer Awards, as outlined in a memo that I submitted. 
and I'll kick this item off. The Board of Supervisors are extremely pleased today to provide an opportunity to publicly recognize our Trailblazer Award winners. Trailblazers are women or girls who through their professional or personal efforts are making extraordinary differences to improve the lives of women in our community. These awards are sponsored by the Santa Cruz County Women's Commission, a nonpartisan advisory board that serves to advance the causes of all women to expand possibilities for women and girls and advocate for empowerment and equality. Fourteen nominations were received by the Women's Commission for these awards and we'll be recognizing six of these nominees today as trailblazers. The commissioners used a strict rating system to review each nomination as well as the applicant's eligibility and impact. Those who have made extraordinary differences in the lives of other women and girls by serving as an innovative leader or pioneer have been selected today as trailblazers. We'll now present the Trailblazers Award and we'll introduce our district commissioners and Trailblazer Award winners and have them approach the podium. Our commissioners will give a summary of our Trailblazer Awardees accomplishments. Supervisor Leopold, if you'd please introduce our first award winner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to invite first district commissioner, Teresa Carino, and first district Trailblazer Awardee, Heidi Boynton, uh, to come up to the podium. Before, before Teresa uh, speaks, I just want to uh, say that I've known Heidi now close to probably 20 years. Uh, we have kids the same age. Uh, she has been a trailblazer for a very long time, uh, who's always been concerned about others. Not only here, when, when we were at SoCal Elementary, the leadership position she took there to help out uh, the school community, uh, help out other kids, but uh, she's been going down to Mexico to help build houses for a long time, and uh, the establishment of uh, the Mini Mermaids is, is just the latest uh, great thing that, uh, that Heidi has done. It's great to see you. I'm really glad that you've uh, won this award, and w welcome, Teresa, another great commissioner. Thank you. Buenos dias. Uh, good morning. I'm Teresa Carino, and the Santa Cruz County Women's Commission is honoring you today, Heidi, as a trailblazer making an extraordinary difference in the lives of women and girls in the focus area of health. Heidi knows firsthand what it means that the finish line is just the beginning. Heidi has been a mentor to me. She is a pillar and an inspiration to women and girls here in Santa Cruz and beyond. She teaches girls and women to listen to their inner mermaid voice. And in case you don't know what that is, it means listening to that powerful, resilient voice that is within all of us. Not just girls, also boys and men. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really want to thank you, Heidi, and I feel honored that I am in your district and I get to award you with this certificate. Supervisor Leopold also has a proclamation for you. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold, for that. I'd like to now invite Laura Cross, our Women's Commission Chair and District 2 Commissioner, to approach the podium. And I'd also like to welcome our District 2 Trailblazer awardee, Kristen <laughs> Peterson, to come to the front. And as a brief introduction of Kristen, who has done a remarkable amount, not just uh, for women and girls, but for the community in general, uh, you serve on so many local commissions and boards, volunteering so much of your time, dedicating time to high school juniors and seniors. When I saw you at that Vision Santa Cruz event for, uh, for the students, for the work that you do on the libraries, for the work that you do with CAB, it goes on and on and on from all the way in the southern portion of the county, all the way to the northern portion of the county, not just for the representation you actually provide in Capitola, but you definitely do deserve this award, Kristen. Ms. Cross, please. This uh, award is in recognition of your inspiring work and significant impact in the field of economic justice and political participation. As a Capitola City Council member, you promoted ideas for affordable housing and economic development. We also applaud your efforts to bring back youth membership to the Capitola City's boards and commissions. Congratulations.
Okay. Uh, our next, for our next uh, award, I'd like to uh, invite Third District Commissioner Carol McPherson uh, to approach the podium. I'd also like to invite Third District Trailblazer awardee Susan Green to come to the front. Uh, so just by way of brief introduction, uh, Ms. McPherson was my middle school teacher uh, and a <laughs> remarkable leader uh, in this community uh, for empowering many generations of women and, and boys in this community. And I can think of no better time to be giving Susan Green this award than on the week that Blaine is reopened, on the week we reauthorize the GEMMA funding. Um, this, is, this is really a testament to your effort in this community. Well, I'm really honored to be the one that gets to give you the award. I've been just blown away by the things that you do for us, and I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of your life. So Susan uh, got her uh, degree from Northwestern and then came to Santa Cruz and got her master's and her PhD. So this is Dr. Green. <laughs> and. Uh, Last year, she presented the county with an incredible research project. It's called Gender Matters. And we're going to be working from that for the next years that we do uh, criminal justice. It's just amazing. And I think you've also been a mover and shaker in making Blaine Street what it is today. I just so enjoyed the event on Thursday, and it's a, an amazing place. And, I know that you have a lot of influence on that. So thank you so much for coming and being such a part of our community. And this says, for your inspiring work and significant impact for women in the field of criminal justice <coughs> reform. And, and she was the original director of Gemma. And you've heard Gemma tour three times today. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at the creator and director very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're going to do a photo. Oh, she should be in the middle. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Caput will announce our next Trailblazer awardees. I'd like to invite Commissioners uh, Maria Barranco and Ari Parker to approach the podium. And I'd also like to invite our District 4 Trailblazer awardees, Maria Campos and Gina Galino Cole, to come to the front. I am so honored to be the one presenting this award to Maria Campos. Uh, Maria Campos is an advocate with Monarch Services, and the focus is uh, violence against women and girls. Maria has spent 21 years providing services to survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. She has committed her life to making a difference in our community. Um, Maria is not only an advocate uh, to everyone who surrounds her, uh, but she's also a fantastic human being. She is compassionate and loving to everyone. She has made significant efforts and made positive difference towards the lives of hundreds of women and girls through support, advocacy, education, and empowerment. Maria has experienced many hardships for her life, and rather than giving up, um, she has been that strong person and has shown that things can definitely happen. But aside from the work that Maria does, she has also raised five children on her own and as a single mother. I want to congratulate Maria for all the amazing work that she has done and her passion and dedication with um, serving women and, and girls. Congratulations, Maria. Very proud. Supervisor Kappa will be bringing a proclamation down as well.
good work. Thank you. Uh, today I'm uh, very lucky to introduce an, um, Gina Cole, who is uh, honored here today for inspiring her inspiring work and significant impact for women in the focus area of education. Gina is an educator and an advocate for health, safety, and the empowerment of girls, women, and families in our diverse community of Watsonville. She is an adv her advocacy for women and girls in sports and athletics has been an integral part professionally and personally of Gina's life path. Gina is a successful educator, a bold community advocate in working with parents to build connections to their children's schools and educating mothers on how to become school leaders and advocates for their children as well as lifelong learners themselves. So today, Gina, for your inspiring work and significant impact for women in the field of education, we'd like to give you this trailblazer award. Thank you. I am a teacher, sadly, and I start giving awards. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Supervisor McPherson will uh, announce our final Trailblazer awardee for the day. Thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, District Commissioner, Fifth District Commissioners Maggie Barr and Sheila Delaney to approach the podium. And I'd also like to invite our Fifth District uh, Trailblazer Blazer awardee, Linda Skiff. Um, Ms. Skiff is uh, a phenomenal person. Um, she's tremendously dedicated uh, to removing invasive species and time and again gets members of the AmeriCorps to come to our 5th District and throughout Santa Cruz County to, um, to protect our natural resources. Um, she's crazy to the point of protecting poison oak, as a matter of fact, <laughs> which is, uh, that's, that's what the rumor is anyway. But <laughs> Ms. Uh, Linda Skiff is truly an outstanding person. She um, gets these young people motivated and having fun doing what they're doing. Uh, I've been to dinners at her house. She feeds them. She takes lunches out to them when they're working. She does so many things, just goes the extra mile. And you could tell that they're appreciative because they're so enthusiastic. I've been to dinners at her Brookdale home with them. Um, she is uh, really uh, something that they really have a high respect for, and it's a great learning experience for them as well. Uh, Lynn Skeff is one of the top people I know who has a deep dedication to protecting our natural resources, and I thank you. Congratulations. Linda is the creator and executive director of the San Lorenzo Valley Habitat Restoration Program, which is part of the Valley Women's Club. And part of that program is the AmeriCorps program. Linda has written successful grants for the last three years to obtain AmeriCorps teams from all over the country to come here. Um, it engages 18 to 24-year-olds 20 in community service, some of which are here today to celebrate Linda's award and also learn a little bit about the, how the county operates. I'd like to ask the AmeriCorps team to stand up. met you all. I don't remember your names, but I remember what you do. Um, Linda is a mentor for those young citizens interested in the preservation of a healthy ecosystem and watershed. The teams have contributed over 14,000 hours towards the restoration of native habitats at parks and nonprofit sites in the San Lorenzo Valley. I think we can be very proud of Linda, very proud of them. And this will be something that you take forward into the rest of your life. And Linda is the reason. Thank you. And 
there'll be a reception outside right after this. <laughs> Food. Still on your thumb. Thank you for allowing us to honor these people. Thank you. It's a great deal. Thank you. We'd like to thank the Women's Commission for your remarkable work that you do, not just in recognizing uh, these community members for what you do every day. We'd like to thank all the AmeriCorps uh, members that are here today. We're really counting on your generation uh, to not just lead this community, but lead this country moving forward to better places. You have taken the first step, quite frankly, by doing what you're doing. You have a great mentor, but we're counting on you to, uh, to do that. We have a reception, as was mentioned. We're going to take, the board's going to take a short uh, recess so that we can participate in this, this reception. Uh, I know. We, I, you know, when you, when you get lectured all the time by the fiscal people up here about, an, you know, the upcoming recession, this just, it gets beaten into you. But for the reception, and, and take a moment, if you don't know one of the Trailblazer awardees, make sure you take a moment to introduce yourself and thank them for what they do because they're working in our community behind the scenes every single day and they're an inspiration for all of us. So congratulations for all of you. We'll join you outside. We're going to move to item 46.
which is a continued public hearing to consider amendments to the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 17.10 regarding affordable housing requirements, the certification of CEQA exemption and related actions, to schedule a public hearing for April 10th, 2018 at 9 a.m. or thereafter to consider changes to the 2017-18 unified fee schedule and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the planning director. This is a continued item from December 12th, 2017. We have the ordinance amending 1710. We have the ordinance with the strikeout and underline with the CEQA notice of exemption and the notice of public hearing in the unified fee schedule. Ms. Conway, welcome. Good morning. We're returning today to continue a public hearing from December 12, 2017, which consisted of a report and recommendations on the county's affordable housing program. Um, I'd ask you to note that the wrong version was of the ordinance was uploaded. You've got replacement pages and there's additional copies in the back. On December 12, 2017, the Board of Supervisors held a public hearing on the affordable housing program update and took action to continue the public hearing to today in order to accommodate additional public outreach and analysis on the developer choice option through which developers rather than the county can elect to fulfill their affordable housing obligation requirement through the payment of impact fee rather than through provision of on-site affordable units for projects of seven or more units. In January, staff invited public input on this matter and plan to return to the Housing Advisory Commission to discuss any resulting recommendations. We received input from the public, but it was after the hack packet was um, out and public and too late for this report back. Input was received and staff will be recommending a process to analyze and create recommendations for your board to consider. Uh, as a reminder to listeners, the county's affordable housing program began after passage of Measure J in 1978, which required the county to adopt policies to ensure that 15% of residential development is affordable to average income households. Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1710 contains the provisions of Measure J and has been um, adapted from time to time. In 2015, the county retained the services of Kaiser Marston Associates to conduct a nexus study and feasibility analysis and resulted in updated affordable housing program um, establishing an affordable housing impact fee, or AHIF, it's, which is a local source of housing funds. Um, besides the impact fee approach, the board also decided for a two-year period to give developers the option of meeting their affordable housing obligation by providing um, an affordable unit or paying HIF with direction to staff to return in two years with a follow-up report. In preparation for the two-year review, Kaiser Marston was again retained to analyze the development economics of the housing program. On October 24, 2017, the Board of Supervisors received the scheduled update on the housing program, provided direction to return with proposed amendments to Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1710. Board direction also included um, a request for further analysis of the affordable housing impact fee for non-residential development um, and to return to the Housing Advisory Commission for a second time to further discuss on-site inclusionary requirements for rental housing. Included in today's draft ordinance are provisions for updated affordable housing impact fees for residential ownership projects and commercial projects, um, incentivizing rental development by encouraging the use of density bonus program and charging a fee rather than requiring um, on-site units for rental, and require HIF payment at building permit final rather than through escrow. One of the key features in today's proposed ordinance is a change to the fees for residential ownership projects. This chart reflects the HIF the board discussed in October and December. Note that the $15 per square foot applies to, will, will apply to units of five, six, and more units. Um, the fees continue to incentivize the construction of smaller homes with the graduated fee scale and includes additions, remodels, and replacements at the same rate, but only for net new square footage over 500 square feet. Fees for ADUs were changed in December. 
Uh, they are established to be consistent with this policy and are charged AHIF as an addition and that exempts the first 500 square feet. The AHIF for commercial development reflect the October direction of an increase to $3 per square foot for commercial uses other than certain agricultural buildings. As requested, staff reviewed commercial development permit history to determine whether the AHIF would create a barrier to mom and pop commercial developments. Um, of 182 permits, only nine included net new square footage. Over half were under 3,000 square feet. The majority of the permits are for tenant improvements that are not subject to HIF. Staff is recommending that HIF continue to apply to new commercial square footage. At the board's direction, the HAC discussed rental housing policies, acknowledging the need for rental housing and the fact that market-driven rental projects are not being proposed in great numbers. The HAC recognized that the inclusionary housing requirement is not a primary barrier uh, to building rental apartments at this time, but that low density and other development standards are likely the greater hurdle. The density bonus provisions of County Code Section 1712 allow for up to 35% additional density along with concessions on development standards. The density bonus program provides an opportunity um, to add, uh, to get badly needed rental housing built and to provide affordable rental units to the inventory. It benefits both the project and it helps to address a compelling community housing need. In 2012, your board adopted the policy of allowing owners of county affordable rental units to charge HUD FMR rather than the Measure J restricted rent. This policy applies to density bonus units also. Uh, since putting this policy in place, more landlords are choosing to rent t tenants with subsidy. The Housing Advisory Commission recognized that the market is not producing rental housing at this time and recommended continuation of the current policy of charging the nominal $2 per square foot. The HEC also requested regular reports on any rental projects that are submitted for approval with the intention of revisiting the program in the future. The current system requires payment of AHIF when homes are sold, resulting in the home buyer facing an unexpected fee that is not part of the purchase price financing. Since the October board action, we've met with several parties who've said that payment when the permit is final would facilitate development and relieve the developer of carrying costs during construction. Um, the fee would then be included in the cost of development, address the issue of unexpected fees for homeowners. Uh, we're recommending that uh, we postpone the discussion of the developer choice option to pay a fee rather than build on-site inclusionary units at 15% of the total units for ownership projects of seven or more units in order to continue a community discussion on that point. It is therefore recommended that your board take the following actions. Reopen the continued public hearing to consider revisions of the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1710 affordable housing requirements. Confirm the proposed project is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Approve the ordinance amending Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1710 in concept. Direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance for second reading and final approval on the next available agenda. Schedule a public hearing for April 10th, 2018 or thereafter to consider changes to the unified fee schedule amending the affordable housing impact fee schedule. Direct the clerk of the board to publish notice of the public hearing at least 10 days prior to the hearing date and direct staff to return to the Board of Supervisors in October 2018 for further consideration of whether to require provision of on-site affordable units in fulfillment of the affordable housing obligations for projects of seven or more units rather than allowing developers to choose to pay the affordable housing impact fee. That concludes my, concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Conway. Are there questions from board members before we reopen the public hearing? Supervisor Caput. You bet. I, I'm looking forward to this. I think it's, uh, it's gonna help the county out. I did notice one thing, it said uh, that we are committed to uh, having affordable housing, which is rental uh, <coughs> housing, 
and it said uh, no more than our fair share uh, of the state mandates. Uh, that's compared to the other counties in the state, is that correct? That's, um, are you quoting from Measure J when it well, said? Well, uh, I read in the uh, report that uh, we're committed to uh, affordable housing, but no more than our fair share of affordable housing in our county. Right, that principle is reflected in, in Measure J as well as our housing That's element, the there. regional fair share allocation and so forth. Okay, and then what I've noticed in the county, it is getting better. I would say the same thing for District 4, no more than our fair share of the affordable housing in the county. So spreading it out countywide rather than having it concentrated on two or maybe three uh, districts in the county. Thanks. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, in reading this report, there were, uh, I was just very disappointed in, the, in knowing that uh, after we put off making decisions on the, this around the developer <coughs> choice uh, option, that, that we're now pushing it back another six months. And what <coughs> confidence should I have in that something will actually happen in this period that, that somehow failed to happen during the last period. I mean, I think the board said we, you know, that, you know, that, uh, that we wanted to do something, that there were enough board members who said, let's wait. Um, but here we are, and um, uh, nothing's happened. And I'm just trying to think, what steps are gonna are take place to ensure that this is gonna happen, and why do we have to wait till October for it to happen? Well, as, as we reflected in the report, um, on the board's direction, immediately January 2nd, we did invite community input. There was a group of people, who many of whom are here today, who are highly interested in this matter and have actually been involved in a very robust discussion. Uh, and we invited them to submit materials uh, in time for us to you know, complete our process, go to the hack, and return to your board by this date. Um, we did get materials. They were too late to um, undertake that discussion, the analysis and discussion for the hack. So, and you know, meanwhile, we've got a, a number of provisions pending. So what we're actually proposing today, and I believe we'll have some speakers uh, who are, will be discussing it, uh, there's a number of proposals uh, that uh, people are interested in having more discussion about. Uh, and um, I look forward to the chance to continue to engage with this group um, who see this as a very important issue. If, if, the, if there's been written materials which mm -hmm. came too late, uh, it's, that seems, uh, it's hard for me to understand that, but it lets, it's came too late. But if those written materials are out, why wait six months on this issue? Well, um, clearly, I mean, we set a deadline in order to accommodate this. We you know, did not get the materials in time. They were very interesting materials. They're very thoughtful. There's a group of people who are highly engaged. Um, proceeding in the, without having the materials in a timely way um, isn't, wouldn't it give us a chance to really have the robust discussion that we're interested in having. I, yeah, I think that we, we didn't see a whole lot of opportunity cost in waiting. Um, you know, we, we're not aware of that many seven plus <coughs> unit projects happening. And so it, it, it seemed that it, more in line with the board's direction to accommodate a robust community conversation and see whether we can't get closer to a consensus between the regulators and the development community. And I think that's, that's the effort that we look forward to engaging in over the next few few months well, I, I, yeah I, I don't I'm not exactly sure um, where you're getting information I've had developers come in and propose 11 and 18 uh, unit developments um, that will that will likely come in for permitting way before October so I, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled if the materials have been submitted mm -hmm. um, from the development community and others and the, we got a letter here from the hack saying they're they're chomping at the bit to have this discussion, um, and and other things. Why, why six months? I just don't. I, I mean, can can we make this happen sooner than than uh, than October? 
I mean, clearly it's, it's at, at your direction. Um, we, we put forward a recommendation that would accommodate um, a, a process to um, have the more robust community conversation, but if, if, it, if six months is too long, then we can certainly uh, embark on a different timeline. Well, so let's just talk about the robust community conversation. So it was also uh, um, pointed out to me by my planning commissioner in the letter we received from the chair of the HAC that meetings that happen at one o'clock in the afternoon uh, may not uh, uh, allow that robust community conversation because it's not it's it's not a very um, it's not a great time to get a lot of people involved because of their uh, that they may be working right um, and uh, I think we should be open if the if the hack is interested in meeting at uh, at different times of the day or this board should uh, uh, should look at uh, allowing the hack to meet more often in order to uh, advance these things that we say we care about I, I you know I, I'm I just think the process is getting in the way of the outcome and I'd like to figure out some way that we could uh, change up the process uh, so we can get the outcomes that people tell us they want, right? I mean, we have these affordable housing advocates, we have these developers, we have a very committed uh, commission, and I'm just, uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we take advantage of that? Um, you know, meetings uh, at, on Wednesdays at one o'clock may not be the best way to make that happen. And so I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to uh, move that along so that robust community conversation can actually happen and that we can actually get something done before October. I'll just add that um, we do have uh, two new staff people the, from authorized positions that we've been unable to fill for the past year, and so they'll be coming into the sustainability policy section. And so part of the, the conversation that, uh, that we're alluding to is the broader conversation about the sustainability general plan update and code modernization, because a lot of the ideas you know, for how to respond to the housing crisis really involve more than just the developer choice issue and whether or not you should they you know the county should choose rather than the developer to allow an on-site inclusionary unit so um, we with the new staffing we're anticipating being able to complete some work and by fall you know six months from now um, you know bring people back into the conversation where we left off with the sustainability and the code mod about some bigger picture approaches to addressing the housing crisis and so that was part of the thinking as well is that it seemed that people wanted to talk more about that just the developer choice issue that that you know the MBEP letter came about you know broader policy changes many of which we're already working on and so kind of revisiting that and, and re-engaging people with, with these, those strategies uh, we thought also would be um, by fall, you know, we'd be ready to, to, to better articulate what those were. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to read between the lines here, trying to figure out if this is a, one more thing that's going to get in the way of the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan getting to environmental review. We've had lots, you know, those conversations started in 2012. So if, and in those conversations, which we were a leader on in terms of talking about increased densities and, and, and looking at things differently, um, new uh, zoning uh, tools, um, last we heard, it was gonna, uh, that there was gonna be some draft out in January 2019. Um, uh, I saw in the recent Pleasure Point meeting that we don't expect it to be approved until spring of 2020. I'm just wondering, is, is this, is, I, I feel like I'm chasing the holy grail. I can't ever figure out how I get to it. Right, right, right. You know, your point's well taken. We're, we're frustrated as well. And like I said, with, with the, um, the focus on the state mandated ADU program, legislative changes, we've spent a lot of time on that. As you know, the cannabis um, program has, has uh, used a lot of staff time and some of the other efforts. Those efforts are getting done now. And so with the two new people and finishing those efforts, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be possible for us as staff to re-engage in the proposed budget. We also have money for the environmental impact um, consultant, and that's the contract that we would hope to have your board approve this fall and start preparing that EIR on the program elements. When do you expect that we'll see a draft EIR about the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan that we approved in October of 2015? in 2019.
and we won't be able to start the EIR until this fall is my and, and it's probably going to be take a year to prepare the draft EIR it, 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 um, I wish we could do it faster yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to do a, a, a bunch of different elements, but we keep on running against, uh, up against this wall, and this wall doesn't ever seem to go away. It just seems to get a little bit taller every time we talk about it. And so I'm just trying to, um, the, the, the issue has been identified as a priority, a crisis. Um, the board has tried to uh, adopt uh, some new policies, and we are stymied. Um, by the lack of this, uh, of this environmental work for things that we've already approved years ago. And so I, 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 I want to uh, try to light a fire in some way to, to have these discussions. It it's, seems uh, developer choice seems like something that we could uh, uh, come to conclusion with pretty quickly. If we want to have more things, but if, if all they're doing is just keep on loading it up till that a document gets done someday, um, we wouldn't have advanced the cause of housing in the community. So um, I implore you uh, uh, to uh, dedicate the resources to start the process to get the work done so, so we can have some new tools to be able to address the housing issues in our Absolutely. community. Are there any other questions from board members before we reopen the public hearing? We're now actually going to reopen the public hearing, give an opportunity for members of the community to provide us with feedback, and then we'll bring it back to the board for discussion and action after that. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Friend, members of the board. I'm J.M. Brown, Chair of your Housing Advisory Commission. I submitted comments to you yesterday by email regarding recent community or commission action on the affordable housing guidelines, but uh, your staff report was prepared before the most recent uh, commission action, so I appreciate the opportunity to chomp at the bit with you in person this morning. Uh, at the commission's March 7th meeting, we voted unanimously to recommend the board approve new guidelines as presented by the planning department staff with the exception of the development developer ch choice component related to inclusionary requirements. If you'll recall, in light of the community debate that took place in December here uh, about in-lieu fees versus on-site requirements, the board, uh, in that discussion um, of those proposed guidelines, sent the matter back to the commission for further review and comment. Generally speaking, commissioners believe there were many beneficial provisions within the guidelines that have been well vetted by the public and could be brought to bear on development projects currently in the pipeline should the board be inclined to support them today. However, in light of various proposals from affordable housing advocates and developers related to inclusionary requirements, density bonus incentives, and other ideas, the commission voted to recommend the board instruct the commission to take further public input on these topics with the expectation that we would return to you with a future recommendation. The Commission stands ready if the Board so wishes to vet these community proposals as well as hear from the Planning Department staff regarding whatever recommend recommendations they ultimately make relative to those inclusionary requirements. We could do so as early as our next regularly scheduled meeting on May 2nd. As Chair of the Commission to Supervisor Leopold's point, I would respectfully ask that if the Board directs the Commission to do this work, that the Board also permit the Commission to meet in Board Chambers at a time that's mo more more accessible to the public, and that would include residents affected by the affordable housing crisis, uh, property owners, and potential developers of affordable housing. I would likewise ask you to instruct the staff to provide the necessary support to accommodate those logistics. As it stands now, as mentioned earlier, we meet every other month in a small conference room in the middle of the afternoon, which is not a time that works for most working people. And even if the commission were to receive strong public interest at, interest at a time like that, the room is so small we could only accommodate about a dozen and members of the public at any given time. So I thank you and I thank the planning department staff for all of your efforts to increase and maintain affordable housing in our community. And I assure you that commissioners look forward to hearing from the public should you instruct us to take on this worthwhile endeavor. I plan to stick around if you have any questions and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you for your work on the commission as well. Good morning, welcome. Please feel free to line up if there's additional people that would like to speak on this item during this public hearing. Good morning, welcome. 
Good morning, um, Robert Singleton with the Business Council. I just want to echo uh, the sentiment that JM came and spoke about um, having a continuation and a, a much broader public discussion about the inclusionary requirements and potentially looking at um, different ways in which we could incentivize the development of more deed-restricted ownership units here. Um, we definitely support uh, looking more at uh, an enhanced density bonus program as well as looking at how we can make the on-site units and the on-site requirements work. Um, we look forward to that robust community discussion. We think the hack is a great uh, body with which to, to take in this public input. Um, we are also totally happy if it, if it is an ex expedited process and takes a, a less time than the six months allotted, but we understand, you know, staff, staff time. Um, in a whole, we in principle support everything that's being brought to your board today, maybe with a little bit of, um, of changes to how the timing works, but ultimately we agree with having the hack be a primary body to hear more public input, have a more robust public discussion, and I think ultimately many of the, uh, the people who are gonna speak with you today have agreed on a lot of common ground over this past couple months. I think there's a joint signed letter that um, was submitted to you guys by MBEP. Um, we support that in concept, and we look forward to filling in the details as we move forward with this public process. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singleton. Good morning, Mr. Willoughby, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, still morning, good, good morning. Uh, Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Um, as you have heard, uh, a number of groups have gotten together uh, and have been discussing this topic, and today we stand in agreement, uh, which is a wonderful thing. We stand in agreement, so we do support the staff recommendation. Uh, we would like to, uh, the reason we would like to do this is because, as you saw from our letter, we see this as a much bigger picture, that if you're taking one little piece at a time, uh, we're not gonna make much progress. So we have to look at some larger picture items uh, and bundle them together in some way so that we can uh, encourage housing development and for our purpose, encourage more affordable housing. Uh, we also agree uh, with Supervisor Leopold that six months might be too long. We know staff has got lots to do, but we would like to see this move uh, as quickly as possible because, six, uh, because we're in a crisis. So uh, we do support that and uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you and thank you for your work. Morning, Ms. Steinbrenner, welcome back. Good morning, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold, for speaking up on this. I really wanna thank you for this. Because I see this as a, a problem in our community where uh, developers are allowed to pay money instead of building affordable housing and it never gets built. And so I think we really need to talk about this developer's choice now and get this cleared up and get some affordable housing coming. I was at the um, Housing Advisory Commission uh, when they met and made this decision and I felt like there was a tremendous pressure from the outside group that presented the information just the day before. I mean, it wasn't even on the agenda, but had they had been told, had been asked by Ms. Conway to submit any information by February 15th. So it sort of handcuffed the, the commission. And one of the things that bothered me and what they're proposing is that um, the county changed the policy in order to allow developers to pay developer fees that will cover the impacts of their development until after the development is occupied. <coughs> I know the grave um, economic crisis that the, is looming before the county, and I feel that if this is allowed, it will put the onus on the taxpayers to really um, fund the improvements that will be needed for this, and it's like putting the cart before the horse. You need the improvements to handle the impact before the, the people come, in my opinion. And um, this proposal that they, this group has put forth under some of the land, uh, Urban Land Institute uh, provisions that they submitted to the commission that day, uh, propose things like that in terms, and also increasing densities to the point that I think uh, we could have small ghettos, actually. <laughs> You've got to look at how the quality of life of some of these places as well as just having a roof over your head. So I think there needs to be a balance. Um, I also uh, note in the um, proposed changes of Ordinance 1710 that all language regarding Measure J is stricken, and I wanna know why that has been done. And I also see that in um, 
1710.039 in section four, um, the compliance with Costa Hawkins Act is stricken. And I'd like some discussion about that because that, as I understand it anyway, has to do with controlling rent um, levels. Um, and I also want to just say that I think there needs to be a good connection, as will come uh, on my understanding with sustainable Santa Cruz County with the water demand that this level of development will do. Um, Soquel Creek Water District does have a water demand offset. Their meeting tonight will be discussing some of those issues, but we really have to address that as we do our land use policy and have water service on the plan check. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Hey, I'm Evan Uh I agree with uh, both the Robert and uh, Affordable Housing Now's uh, group. I'm on signed both letters, and uh, what I, my take on it is that uh, we would need more uh, absolute number of affordable housing units, and this inclusionary thing is an essential part, but doing it alone is not gonna have much more than perhaps a symbolic effect. Uh, lately, I've been geeking out and looking at some California Department of uh, Finance Population and Housing Estimates, and thought I'd share some of this with you. Since uh, 1990, uh, throughout Santa Cruz County, all jurisdictions, uh, the population percent increase has been larger than the housing unit increase for 20 of the last 27 years. And during the past 10 years, it's been uh, much worse. Uh, we're currently in a 10 year streak of population increasing faster than housing. And it's to the point where uh, there's been 10.77 additional people per additional housing unit. So the 500 homes uh, that uh, we talked about is given like the total number of construction represents 0.8% of uh, all housing units in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. So we're just not building enough housing for the growing population, we need more housing. So uh, I support both these uh, letters because they take a look at the bigger picture and you know, we need to reduce uh, certainty in the process of getting housing approved and built need to uh, curtail exclusionary zoning, and we need uh, you know, better financing and funds for affordable housing, and we need uh, to reduce the cost of entitlement. So you know, whatever happens today, uh, I hope that it's sort of a starting point for uh, moving beyond this single issue and looking at the bigger picture ones that uh, we'll, both groups you know, agree on, and that will increase the absolute number of affordable housing units. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Good morning, Mr. Huerta, welcome. Super tall there. Um, good morning, Chair, Board of Supervisors. Um, Matt Huerta, Housing Program Manager with Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Over 80 members across the three county region uh, representing the largest major employers. Um, both public, private, and nonprofit, and housing is one of our key initiatives, as you know. And um, so, I'm really happy to actually see that uh, kind of the disparate groups, uh, majority disparate groups that had contentions around certain issues, are, are joining together at least uh, today um, to support staff's recommendations. Um, you know when necessary, phasing in some of these major policy decisions is appropriate. So this is obviously one that, uh, you know, hof hopefully we can get to a, a better, more comprehensive package sooner than later. Um, but uh, certainly the pieces that can move forward now ought to. And uh, as an example, one of our, our key policy initiatives is to help make sure um, that that we see more of, of a, a middle ground in terms of, of different housing types. So the fact that you have a very strong, you know, graduated scale kind of program in terms of your fee schedule, that's something to be support and move forward with as an example, because that's 
going to help drive down, hopefully, the um, incentivize the development of, of uh, smaller homes and um, hopefully consequ consequentially, um, you know, more have them be lower cost or more affordable, as an example. So um, we su certainly support that. We'll continue to track this. Um, uh, back to a point that was made earlier, uh, you know, we're not really going to crack this nut until we identify more sites, uh, more higher density sites, and that's not going to happen until uh, we have the map laid out in front of us, and that's Santa Cruz uh, sustainable plan, other pieces that need to get baked into that. Um, however, uh, through, I think that um, in the course of the, that more meaty conversation over the next few months, um, what I think will breathe more life into these policies is recognition about what that policy ought to look like and engagement around the specific sites and densities so that maybe there's uh, you know, developer choice option and other pieces of your affordable housing policy can move forward without having to wait for the two, you know, the, this, this longer term process. Um, but um, let's identify those specific sites that can move forward without uh, the, the longer term EIR process that's going to allow for even more housing to happen. But uh, we look forward to finding those opportunities and supporting that along the way with uh, uh, all the stakeholders involved. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Simon. Welcome. Hi, I'm Sibley Simon. I'm an affordable and uh, workforce housing developer, and I'm just want to make one point, uh, which is what I hope. Well, first of all, I actually do want to thank staff for making these recommendations. I hope you pass these recommendations today. Um, I'm excited to participate. Uh, I agree from my perspective. I don't think it needs to be six months, but in any case, I want to move forward. And I'll just tell you uh, very clearly what my goal is in participating in this. I hope that we can uh, get an enhanced bonus density ordinance so that we create more inclusionary affordable housing. I think we get in the bind of what is the percentage on our inclusionary ordinance and the in-lieu fees and how big does a project need to be to not have the in-lieu fee option, et cetera, et cetera. And um, w wherever we put that line and those lines, um, we don't get enough affordable housing. And by my count, uh, over the last 40 years, we've averaged about 14 units a year of inclusionary housing. It's way better than not having those, but I think we can do better. And the best method I've seen in the state of California with our set of policies that we already have in that regulatory context for trying to do that is the bonus density ordinance. It's really great that Santa Cruz County's done something already as, uh, Julie was mentioning, that uh, is already causing more developers to use the bonus density, which is allow the uh, fair market rents. I'm really excited about that because it creates rental housing as opposed to for sale housing uh, as often and um, gets that inclusionary housing built. I think we can do even more, and I don't think it'll have to be you know, a huge uh, policy effort to get that done. I'd just like to make it a little bit well, I think it's significantly better. We'll get some more inclusionary housing. And I think it is what's caused the beginning of the consensus building is the realization if we had a little bit more on the bonus density, we can get more parties, uh, even more parties on board with going to, uh, with get rid of, uh, getting rid of the in lieu fee option. And both those things together would create more inclusionary housing, would up that average number of inclusionary housing units per year, and I would really love to see that happen. So it's why I'm willing to invest more time over the next few months to see if we can get there, um, and I hope that we do, and I thank staff uh, tremendously for the opportunity. Thank you for those comments. Anybody else? Good morning, Mr. Bauer. Uh, thank you, Supervisors, and I want to uh, uh, comment on uh, Julia's uh, hard work over the last few months. And uh, if anyone in this room is to be blamed for providing information late to this uh, body, it's me. Uh, we had conversations back in December and January, and we were under the impression that the, the deadline was uh, further in advance than the date that she set. Uh, we submitted the material that hit your boxes uh, nine hours after the uh, hack material went out. So uh, I just want to preface that as we apologize for that material being late. It's been in the public domain for a number of years, so it's not new, new information, but it's, it, it was consensus building information that drove us to write a letter that supported broadly. Uh, I'm here today to, to thank uh, the, the folks that have spoken brief previously that there is consensus on the motion that you have before you. We believe that uh, the, an April hearing date 
Brigade through HAC is the right means to, to address this issue. Secondly, we would hope that, uh, the, that a motion could be put forward to accelerate the process before October. I think October is way too late. It's beyond uh, the, the, the tendency when you get into an election cycle, and I think this would be lost in the discussion. And I think that there's enough consensus today that inclusionary zoning should be part of your, your motion and providing options on the table that allow that, uh, that, that uh, that type of uh, building to be built. Uh, I'm gonna leave it with uh, the three A's, uh, affordability, affordability, availability, and accountability. We don't have enough affordable housing in our market. Uh, we don't have enough availability of people to buy or uh, build those houses. And accountability is all the people in this room. We're all accountable to each other, to this community, to build more housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byers. Is there anybody else that'd like to address us? Mr. Alexander, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to remind members of the public, you know, we have a shared humanity. And uh, Supervisor Leopold, I do, uh, you know, feel your political frustration. And also the ladies right here uh, talking about the six months, just uh, the deliberate, um, it just seems like it's deliberate stonewalling. And the American public, like I said, they need affordable housing. It, this is a great county, and you guys are great men. We have to do great things for the American public. So I want to be able to offer you this, uh, Supervisor Leopold. Maybe you can help push a little bit, unplug the, the pipeline for affordable housing. It got stuck. Oh, oh. It takes a man effort, but I want to be able to say that. We need, we need all your guys' support to push that. You know, there's a lot of great people here that work, that need, need that, uh, the, those affordable housing. And it's important because in order for, for us to continue building up Santa Cruz, we need people that are gonna come and do that work. You know, imagine you guys living in a different county because you guys can't afford it here. It's very difficult for a lot of people, but you, you guys being able to do what you guys can and, and spearhead this and keep ramrodding and keep saying, hey, we gotta do this a lot faster because it just seems like it's a political will of the whips that's going nowhere. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else would like to address us in this public hearing? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I'll briefly make some comments and, make, and hand it over to my colleagues for a motion. Um, you know, we are actually taking significant actions today. There's just one piece that, that we're proposing to defer, but I think that uh, the board has consensus. We'd ask for additional research, including on the actions that we are taking today on the fees, and I appreciate the work <clears throat> of staff on that. I do think that there's consensus as well to move the date up. I think that there's consensus to have the hack take a greater uh, role in this. I think that uh, we should recognize, and we can't underscore enough, the fact that you have disparate groups of people coming together, people that wouldn't normally participate in a process together, social justice, environmental, affordable housing developers, uh, uh, market rate developers actually coming together and reaching a consensus. And I think that we should, um, A, highlight uh, what kind of crisis we have to be in to bring those groups together to actually have that level of consensus, but B, also uh, harness that energy to make sure that they uh, continue to stay engaged because it strikes me there's really Nothing we can't do if we continue to have that level of broad-based support across the community. But complex issues such as housing don't have, uh, can't be solved by a single input. So I think it is important that we actually look at this in a broader context uh, and not silo this issue the way that it's been siloed as just an affordable housing ordinance issue when a significant component of this is outside of the affordable housing ordinance and needs to be addressed uh, by this board and by this community moving forward. Because anything we do within the affordable housing ordinance actually has an impact on the other elements and vice versa about whether something can be tolerated or accepted or where that breaking point is of what builds affordable housing within our community. In and of itself, a single fee or a single requirement may not actually be problematic, but in the greater context of a lot of things it might be. And so I think that it actually makes sense to take a complex issue and look at it in a complex way to bring together uh, disparate interests that are coming together in a consensus, and I think we're really close. I think we are close enough that I, I agree with Supervisor Leopold that we should be able to move this uh, faster in October as a result. Um, but I, I'll move it to uh, Supervisor Coonerty first, and hopefully board members will move toward a motion soon. Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. So actually, I have a question for County Council, which is if the hack um uh, advise the creation of a density, an additional density bonus ordinance, would that have to go to the Planning Commission as well before it comes back to us? Or maybe it's you all. 
I think if it's in the zoning ordinance 1310, then it would. So I'll, I'll say that um, most likely, um, okay. because it affects the limits on development. So typically that's defined as a zoning ordinance. Okay. Um, so let me let me make a stab at a motion, but I'm certainly open to hearing my uh, colleagues' uh, uh, input, which is to move the staff recommendation uh, to, but add additional direction that the May 2nd hack uh, meeting be at a time and place convenient to the public, uh, that uh, it then, um, uh, and that it focus on this, on a bones, uh, density bonus uh, ordinance, as well as the per square foot uh, uh, um, fees, other county fees that are charged on moving to a, on a per square foot basis, um, and that that return to us uh, after going to the planning commission um, at the first available meeting in August or September. There's a motion. Is there a second to that before we provide amendments or discussion? I'll second that. There's a second from Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Leopold, additional discussion or uh, amendments? Thank you. You know, I, I generally support the, uh, the, the motion, and I, I encourage us to have this uh, broader discussion. I think it would be helpful. I think that uh, the issue of density bonuses is, um, is loaded, and there are lots of good reasons why to look at density bonuses, and there's a lot of public education has to go on. So I would look to the, my community partners, uh, whether it be Affordable Housing Now, whether it be the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, whether it be the Chambers or others, that you need to begin to have these conversations with the <coughs> public. It's not enough just to talk to members of the board or members of the Housing Advisory uh, Commission, that it's really important to have these discussions with the public. And, you, and the, with the, the suggestions from my colleague, about timing, there is time to, to start having those discussion to get feedback uh, from the public. Uh, because uh, it, that, I thought in 2015 when we approved the, the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan that we were really talking about new kind of development patterns here in Santa Cruz County. And, and I thought that, would, that, was a, that was a big lift. It involved lots of conversations with hundreds of people. Um, and we've, we haven't moved that ball at all since then. Um, and now we want to add something else to it. Uh, maybe it won't have to go part of the environmental review, but it's part of this general discussion. And um, it's going to be important to, to, to really gauge interest out in the community for this. And so I ask you to, to take that responsibility to hold those meetings um, and start having that community conversation uh, because I think it will inform the uh, overall decision. Um, as I look at the, uh, the recommendations here today, uh, I would say that the, the, the one that I, I, uh, I feel less good about is the lack of an inclusionary requirement for rental housing. I've heard the arguments about why, we, uh, why people don't think that's a great idea, but then I see the reality of what is being built. And as I look in the city of Santa Cruz with the new Swenson project on Pacific Avenue, that which was supposed to be affordable by design, 600 square feet, is gonna be renting for $2,800 a month. You could get a cheaper room for 440 square feet for only $2,300 a month. That's not affordable by design, and, 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 a, and a lot of people I work with. Uh, and so we need to me, having some kind of inclusionary requirement for rental housing would have been a um, would have been an additional tool uh, because I think we're going to see the development of a lot of rental housing. Um, but I hear from uh, advocates on both sides that they were supportive of it, so I'll, I'll be supportive of it. But I, I think it's a missed opportunity, and if we see more of 600 square foot apartments renting for for $2,000, $3,000, I would say that's a failure of our housing policy um, because we need, that, that is not affordable for people who, who live and work here. That's affordable for being a bedroom community to the Silicon Valley. 
and uh, and th there's there's housing needs for folks who go over the hill, but it doesn't really help the people who live and work here. Um, I hope that in the making of the motion, uh, my colleague didn't mention the inclusionary zoning, but I, I'm assuming that was part of it, uh, as, as part of the density bonus discussion and all the other pieces. Item seven on the recommendation. It is, it is, um, and actually I was gonna make a additional comment, which is I didn't mention the, I specifically didn't mention the issue of developer choice, because from my perspective, that's a settled issue from a majority of the board. So. Uh, I want the hack to focus on these new issues going forward. Well, I, if it agrees with me, I'm, I'm happy with it. It's a set of choice. <laughs> um, and I don't know why we don't do it today, but the, the, uh, uh, I would want this to come back. I'm, I'm glad to support having the Housing Advisory Commission to meet um, in a place where more people can participate. Um, I think that to have this housing discussion and to think differently about housing, we need to get a lot more people involved. And, that, and that's a, a challenge to us all, to ensure that that community discussion is taking place. And as a point of clarification, since you moved the recommended actions, item number seven actually is for them to come back regarding that item. So assumedly it's not a settled item, they're coming back uh, at that first meeting in August or September with that. Component. Correct, but I think, I mean, I just, because we've had this ongoing debate, I think that as I currently read it, there are not three votes for to, ha to maintain the developer choice. And so I, I would hope the hack doesn't spend an inordinate amount of time on that issue and instead focuses on these much more complex issues around yeah, sure. density bonuses, per square foot fees uh, going forward. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, we'll be supporting that this motion. Um, you know, I think the the point about we need to identify um, high density sites because um, there's pressure in the fourth district for agricultural to be protected. The ge geography up in the fifth district is very difficult to be uh, to build uh, 20 units anywhere, uh, for instance. And so I think it's going to be in for the impact and and our infrastructure too. Uh, this is, um, uh, if we can get to a win-win situation, it'll be a miracle. I mean, you have people that say we want affordable housing and every, uh, many others that say we don't have the infrastructure and roads and water and so forth to accommodate it. Well, we, uh, we have to, um, I, I believe, um, find a way to build more housing. And this isn't just a local problem here in this county. Um, Statewide, my understanding is that they they want to be, uh, they say the target is to build 180,000 units a year in California, and there are less than half of that is being built. So uh, this is not the only county that's facing uh, is facing uh, this predicament, but uh, it's something that I, I think we're going to we're changing our, our our move here, and I think it's the correct one, and I'll be supporting the motion. S Supervisor Caput, any additional comments? I'll be supporting this also. I think what's important, uh, <clears throat> if we were to do our, uh, more than our share of uh, uh, providing housing, uh, what we all also have to look at, when you put in housing, uh, we have uh, more water being used, we have uh, road maintenance, we also have more traffic, of course, but then uh, there's a point where you have to build another school, especially in South County. And then uh, uh, public safety, uh, what we're gonna grow in the population and we're not gonna add a police officer, we're not gonna add a firefighter. Uh, you know, all of this goes together. So uh, whatever we're taking on now is really important. We gotta, we gotta look at the big picture. And uh, uh, anyway, I'm committed to voting yes on this. So right now is the motion clear with staff do you have any additional questions of the board before we take action on the motion is is uh are you envisioning then the may 2nd hack meeting to be sort of a public forum on broader housing affordability issues um then and and then articulating some de potential changes to the density bonus provisions in particular and processing those. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I think I think the conversations as I understand them have started um, and different proposals have been made and that the May 2nd meeting 
uh, would be an opportunity for the hack to look at these, to look at uh, different approaches, their proposals, how they might be impacted on different at different sites. Uh, then it would go to the planning commission, and then it would come to us. Let me just say that if the hack is unable to, to, to complete that discussion on May 2nd, they should schedule another meeting and not wait two more months. Correct. I mean, just the idea, the, the, the mission we're trying to send is to move this along. Yeah. Any additional clarification, Ms. Prevacich or Ms. Conway? And the, the per square foot fees, um, you're speaking about all of the various impact fees and utility connection fees? That we, that the county controls. That the, okay, any of them that the county controls, all right. Ms. Conway, any additional questions? I was working through in my mind the uh, uh, timing on, uh, I mean, I'm really looking forward to engaging um, on, on these points. I think they're really interesting points. I do think that the public process that's gonna be involved um, is gonna require a bit of analysis. Um, and I think the May 2nd meeting will be a, a, a great opportunity to, um, and we'll do everything we can to have conducted that analysis on, for instance, uh, doubling the density bonus. What, what, what are the CEQA requirements gonna be? Um, as a result of that. And you know, we will we'll certainly get, do everything we can to gather the information um, and have a, a process laid out uh, where we can reasonably get those questions answered. Um, I certainly share the sense of urgency uh, and uh, am eager to jump in and do this, uh, to do this work. Thank you. And I'll just close by saying the board also has a responsibility when projects come forward to us that we hold strong on these projects and, and because you know the neighborhoods do come forward and want a unit or two that are, get removed, uh, but we have to, every unit is very difficult to get built in this county and so I think that uh, we can change all the codes we want, but we still actually have to approve projects when they come forward and I think that we have our own responsibility to uh, take it as the top priority that it is for so many within our community. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you for everybody that's been working on this issue, and thank you for planning staff and council as well for your work on this. We'll move on to uh, Zone 7. We'll take a second for people to come join us up here that are here for Zone 7. It's a squat and hold, so I want you to bend down and hold it for a minute. Perfect. It's solid. Perfect. It's solid. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank everybody with Zone 7 for their patience. We're now going to move on to Zone 7. If we could kick off Zone 7 with a roll call, please. Director Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Kepit. Here. McPherson. Here. Lynn. Here. Bilicich? Here. DeHart? Ponce? Siri? Gonzalez? Chair Friend? Here, and we do have a quorum. We'll begin uh, by asking, are there any changes to today's agenda? No changes. Wonderful. We'll move on to oral communications. It's a chance for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the purview specifically of Zone 7. Is there anybody that would like to address us? Seeing none, we'll close oral communications and move on to item two, which is Board. Director Bilicich. Oh, I'm sorry. Director Bilicich, please. Just, just quickly, I, um, I know that uh, John Presley is going to be retiring, and on behalf of the city, I think it would be, he, he was a great, did a great service for us, and um, Watsonville was, he was always very responsible to our needs, and I just wanted to acknowledge him for his service 
I don't see him here, but we thank him for his, um, for his fine work. And I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, all the repairs on the South Spuetis Creek. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for oral communications? Okay. The first item of business is approval of the Zone 7 board meeting minutes. We have the minutes of January 23rd. Are there any questions on the minutes? <coughs> yes. No. Go ahead. Uh, is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on the minutes? All right, I'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move to approve. Second. We have a motion from Caput, a second from Leopold. And I abstain, because I was not present. An abstention from Director Bilicic. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, it passes unanimously with one abstention. We'll now move on to item three, to the first item of the regular agenda, as the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to accept and file a status report on the Corps of Engineers storm damage repairs on Pajaro River flood risk reduction project as recommended by the District Engineer, Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Friend, members of the Board. Um, I'm here to report to you that we continue to have ongoing discussion with Army Corps of Engineers on their storm damage repairs on the Pajaro River and Salsa Puedes Creek. Um, we continue to have bi-weekly phone discussions with them and continue to urge their speedy uh, repair of these sites. Um, we have been informed that Congressman Panetta and Colonel Rayfield have discussed a finalized timeline for those repairs to occur. Um, they are expecting to award a contract for those repairs no later than April 30th of 2018, which would entail a start of construction uh, for these repairs in June. Um, and we are prepared at the staff level to request any advanced direct assistance from the Corps ahead of forecasts for large storms um, should we have them. And fortunately, the storm that we're expecting this week is not one of them. Um, I'd also like to uh, provide an update on the levee reconstruction project, the Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project. Uh, we have attended a agency decision milestone meeting, which is a major milestone in the feasibility stage of the project. This occurred on January 26th of this year. The ADM, or the Agency Decision Milestone, represents a corporate endorsement um, of the recommended plan that's being proposed by Army Corps of Engineers and it uh, provides a path forward to a finalized feasibility report that we continue to expect uh, its completion for July of this year, 2018. Um, the following work elements are provided in that report. Um, the completion of the development of a feasibility level design for the recommended levy reconstruction plan, responses to uh, agency technical re review and other comments on their draft report, um, it's an, gonna have an accounting of other social effects, which um, we view as a very important appendix to the report to comment on life safety and socioeconomic importance of this project, which we feel very strongly about. And um, it is a chance to finalize the Corps' uh, National Environmental um, Policy Act uh, compliance. Um, we are going to continue to work very closely with the Corps to help them uh, address the other social effects accounting so that it benefits <laughs> project fundability to the maximum extent that it can and to make that accounting persuasive. Um, the director's report will allow the project to move into the engineering design phase of the project. We are continuing to work with the Corps and with our um, legislative uh, uh, offices to find ways to fund this project so that we can have unfettered progress into design and hopefully construction. Um, we're recommending that the board accept and file this report. Thank you, Mr. Strudley. Thank you for your outstanding work on this issue in the last year. Director Bilsich. When were the um, repairs discovered on the South Poitiers Creek? When were, you know that they needed repair? When was that discovered? District staff performed reconnaissance surveys with the Corps shortly after the storms occurred in March of last year. March of last year. And then we were told that these repairs would be made like, I think, June, and then it was November and December. We are so lucky that we aren't having that great storm. How many, how many repairs are there? 11, 13? I can't remember the number. There are 17 sites. That we'll 17 be sites. So here are the people in Bay Village that keep saying, you know, um, are we okay? Are we okay? You know, they're very nervous. We have 17 sites and we can't repair because government moves slowly? Why? Why can't we repair these? The Corps has been uh, 
very problematic in their completion of contracting to move this forward. Um, we've been uh, working very actively with them where we share the same exact concerns and we've also had our drainage crews replace protective measures on the most critical sites. Um, and again, we are prepared to act very proactively should a storm of significant size come our way. So we, we share your concern uh, and have been working with the Corps and our legislators to try to get this done as quickly as possible. I'm not uh, upset with the county. I'm not upset with the city. But I don't think uh, the Corps understands the urgency of what the people went through last year. And when we discovered there are 17 sites that need repair, certainly we would have those fixed before the next rainy season. So here we are, we're in the same place, and nothing's happened. How do we, and I know Congressman Panetta has been very, you know, proactive, but how do we get them to move? Government is too slow. If this happens, what happens to the people? And they are um, extremely apprehensive every time we have a little bit of rain. Are we okay? Are we okay? And I, you know, the city's right there and the county's right there to fix things in emergency. But how do we get the core to move more quickly? We're going through a whole nother rainy season before anything is possibly going to happen. We think it's going to happen in, would you say June? June, yes. M maybe. They have made that arrangement um, at the congressional level, so I expect them to stick to that schedule. Um, in, a, in a striking twist of irony, we are actually the first um, recipients of their repair work um, through that district, if you can believe that. Uh, That's a great thing, that we are first, but my gosh, a whole nother rainy season has gone by, and I, I don't know how to expedite that or how to get them to understand the urgency. But thank you for your work. Thank you Appreciate very much. It. Thank you, Director Bilicic. The board unanimous, uh, we all share that concern. And, and thank you to Public Works for winterizing those locations to ensure that they didn't get any worse during this time and ensure the safety of people in that area. Is there anybody else I'd like to ask any questions on this item before we open it up to the community? Wait, any public comment, go ahead. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this first item on the agenda? All right, we'll bring it back to the board for action. And I'll, uh, I'll make a comment now. Can you make a, a motion and a comment then? I will. I, I will move to approve. Uh, motion, I, one sec. second. I'll second. A, okay, one second, go ahead. Uh, the, the commitment's gonna be uh, from all of us uh, to support you in your work. I'm a little bit alarmed by the changes going on with public works and, uh, and losing staff members that are a key to this. Uh, I, I want to be. I want it to be known that uh, the county has got to look at this as a number one priority, and we need to hold. Uh, we have. To, we got to help you guys out. So uh, we're, we lost uh, the head of the public works uh, is uh, leaving. We lost Bruce Leclerc not too long ago, and there might be other changes coming up. I, I find that alarming and. Uh, I want to make sure that we're not going to uh, trip this whole thing up. What, what is your comment? How are things going? Are, are these changes going to somehow hurt us? There's going to be no derailment of this process. I'm still here working passionately and feverishly on both the storm damage repairs and the federal reconstruction project. We're not going to lose any momentum with that, and we continue to backfill our positions in at Zone 7 staff of very talented and motivated people. Right, and uh, we do, uh, one plus has been uh, more energy from uh, congressional staffing, I guess, with uh, Congressman uh, Pernetta. Uh, uh, does he have any help on this? So he has been having some conversations um, at the federal level. Um, he's been an extremely uh, aggressive champion of this project, and he, his momentum has not let up either. So we're very fortunate to have him on our side um, working with us, and um, we expect that to, to pay some dividends, and we are very hopeful that this project is going to get built. Have we had any contact with uh, 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 congressional member uh, issue? Uh, I don't believe so, but he has had discussions, ongoing discussions with uh, headquarters, uh, Army Corps staff, such as Colonel Rayfield, um, as well as other members of the Senate Environmental Public Works Subcommittee. Right. 
on core related issues. Okay. Well, we have a motion and a second to answer that question. Congresswoman Eshoo has been uh, briefed through the authority, uh, which touches her district and has been involved throughout uh, the flood prevention authority process. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to item four, which is as the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to approve existing on-call list of firms to provide civil engineering design and environmental services to Zone 7 for various projects as recommended by the district engineer. Mr. Shredley. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Zone 7 District is proposing to save time and resources by utilizing a uh, existing county public works on-call engineering consultant list for ongoing and proposed uh, flood risk reduction and storm damage repair projects. Um, this list was uh, approved um, in September of last year through uh, an RFQ that was issued on March 24th, 2017. Um, the top five firms uh, are articulated in the board memo um, that we would use for uh, various services that are strongly in line with what we require at Zone 7 um, for storm damage repair and other hydraulic and, and engineering related studies. Um, we are recommending that the board approve the, the use of this uh, list and the consulting firms that are on this list. Um, the consultants would be independently selected for specific projects and um, we would align, of course, our, our process with county purchasing policy um, depending on the size of the contract that we're pursuing. And uh, we would recommend that the board approve the five consultants listed above uh, on the board memo for on-call civil engineering design and environmental services for use by the Zone 7 District through June 30th, 2020. Thank you. I think this is a good idea. Are there any directors or questions on this item? Any it's director bills? Make a motion. Is, is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Uh, we'll close the comment period. Director Bilsich? I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. <laughs> We we'll move on to item five, which is as the Board of Zone 5 to approve amendment to agreement with Native Vegetation Network for revegetation consulting services for the Pajaro River Bench Excavation Project by extending the contract through June 30th, 2019 and increasing compensation by $46,760 for a not to exceed amount of $352,698 and take related actions as recommended by the district engineer, Mr. Stradley. Thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, on April 16, 2013, the board approved a five-year contract with Native Vegetation Network um, to provide revegetation consulting services um, and other survey work um, for the Power River Bench Excavation Project. And this firm was integral in preparing um, the replanting designs and revegetation plan. Um, their scope of work um, includes site surveys of revegetation areas um, and assessments of plant survival and vigor, invasive plant growth and erosion, and storm damage as well as human activities present. Um, establishment period for revegetation area extends through fall of this year, 2018, with a final report for that uh, establishment period to be completed in winter 2019, so this coming winter. Um, so attached for your board's consideration is an amendment to the agreement to extend their contract for an additional year um, to increase uh, their contract to $352,698 in order to continue this establishment period monitoring and to complete the last annual report for the establishment period. Um, using NVN for these services are, is going to save the district resources because of the history that they have with this project, their familiarity and uh, their ability to expedite the analysis that they do. Um, sufficient funding is available in our in our budget to pursue this. Um, it is therefore recommended that the board approve the attached amendment to the agreement with Native Vegetation Network, extending the term of the agreement to June 30th, 2019, and increasing compensation by $46,760 for a not to exceed amount of $352,698, and to authorize the district engineer to sign the amendment to agreement on behalf of the district. Thank you. Questions? Director Bill, such please. I see that we have a botanist and a revegetation specialist, a field technician. What do we use a graphics designer for? The for graphics this project. Yes, the graphics designer uh, is used mainly for the reporting purposes, um, and also the graphics that they provide are also shared with other consultants that we use for hydraulic studies and other permitting needs. Thank you. Anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item, please feel free to step forward. 
Morning, Ms. Steinbrenner. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner from Aptos. Um, I would like to make a suggestion to Public Works and to your board that um, there be some location and a, established for local tree companies to bring uh, root, tree root masses that apparently um, to, to be stored for use in, in rehabilitation work um, at a Water Advisory Commission meeting, County Water Advisory Commission meeting. Um, Ms. Kittleson, who's with County Environmental Health in uh, stream rehabilitation work, mentioned that those are in very short supply and very much sought after for this type of work. Um, this was during last winter's storm when tree companies were <coughs> plowing them and taking them everywhere and, and grinding them up. I, um, I feel that we could help these efforts, rehabilitation efforts, if the county had some place and partnered with local tree companies that those companies could bring those tree masses, and there's a word for it, I can't remember what it is right now, those, those tree root masses that are integral in reestablishing um, stream habitat uh, that those could be stored and used for rehabilitation projects around uh, such as this one. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Bring it back to the board for action. I'll we'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion from Bilicic, second from Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Item six which is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to approve amendment to the agreement with Capital Edge Advocacy Incorporated for advocacy services for the Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project through June 30th, 2020 at the current rate of 65,000 per fiscal year and take related actions as recommended by District Engineer, Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair, friend, members of the board. At June 15th, 2015, Zone 7 meeting, the board approved a contract with Capital Edge Advocacy Services um, for our long-term levee reconstruction project, the Paha River Flood Risk Reduction Project, extending through June 30th, 2020. However, the board memo associated with this item inadvertently recommended only to extend the services through June 30th, 2018. Um, Capital Edge currently provides federal advocacy services to the district um, and have, for several years has organized annual visits for local district staff and officials to visit Army Corps staff in uh, Washington, D.C., as well as legislative offices uh, to champion our levy reconstruction project. And they've worked very effectively year-round in providing um, information to us, as well as informing congressional representatives uh, of our project, as well as key committee staff and its importance. Um, Capital Edge has extensive knowledge through this history of our project's needs um, and the constituents involved, as well as um, established relationships with congressional representatives and key committee staff. And this uniquely qualifies them to continue their work with us. Um, as we near the, the project's uh, completion of the planning phase, it's going to become increasingly important, important excuse me, to continue advocacy work um, at the federal level um, with Capital Edge Advocacy at our side. And we are requesting authorization of an amendment to agreement to support this that would extend the services um, by Capital Edge through June 30th, 2020 to align board direction with the previously signed independent contractor agreement from June 15th of 2015. Um, it is therefore recommended that the board approve the attached amendment to agreement with Capital Edge Advocacy for an advocacy services for the Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project through June 30th, 2020 at the current rate of $65,000 per fiscal year and authorize the district engineer to sign the amendment to the agreement on behalf of the district. Thank you, Mr. Strudley. Questions on an item we've basically already adopted? <laughs> is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? I'll bring it back to the board for action. I move approval of the recommended action. And I'll second. Uh, motion from Leopold, a second from Bilicic. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on to the final item of Zone 7, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to adopt a resolution confirming the 2018-19 benefit assessment rates, adopt resolution setting the public hearing, and take related actions as recommended by the district engineer, Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair, friend, members of the board. Pursuant to the 1991 Zone 7 Flood Control and Water Conservation District Engineers Report, the district must annually compute benefit assessment rates. 
Additionally, the district engineer must submit a report describing each parcel of real property receiving the special benefit and the amount of the charge for each parcel for the upcoming fiscal year to the Zone 7 Board of Directors. The 2018-2019 rates for all land use categories will be increased by 2.9% as calculated in the 2017 Annual Consumer Price Index. The 1991 District Engineer's Report, previously approved by your board, allows for an annual CPI adjustment of the benefit assessment up to a maximum of 4%. The rate for single-family residents shall be increased from $77.96 to $80.22. Agricultural, unimproved, commercial industrial parcels, churches and schools are charged by acreage, and their rates are increased by the 2.9% CPI. As part of the annual proceedings, the board must set a public hearing, notice the hearing, and consider objections and protests, if any, to the data included in the benefit assessment rate report. Once today's actions have been approved by the board, the district will place the benefit assessment rate report on file with the clerk of the board. This report containing the assessor's parcel number, use code, and owner's name, and the amount of the assessment will be available on or before May 11th, 2018 which will allow for public review six weeks prior to the proposed June 18th, 2018 public hearing. As in previous years, the rate report must be approved by your board and forwarded to the auditor controller by August 10th, 2018, <coughs> in order to be included on the 2018-2019 property tax assessment roll. It is therefore recommended that the board adopt the attached resolution confirming the previously established Zone 7 benefit assessment rates by the CPI for fiscal year 2018-2019, Adopt the attached resolution setting Tuesday, June 18th, 2018 at 7 p.m. or thereafter in the Watsonville City Council Chambers as the date and time for public hearing on the 2018-2019 <coughs> benefit assessment rate report and direct the clerk of the board to publish the attached notice of public hearing once a week for two weeks prior to the hearing in a newspaper of general circulation. But other than that, there are no recommended actions. Do, are there any questions from the board on this item? Director Bilsich. Just a quick question. I, I know that we can um, charge up to 4%. We're doing this CPI 2.9. Is, what, what is the funding used for? I mean, you know, people inquire all the time just because it's a small increase. But again, you know, it keeps going up every year because we need to do that. But what do we use the funding for? The main purposes of our funding in Zone 7 as articulated in our formation documents is to provide uh, maintenance operations of the existing flood control facility as well as providing funding for uh, uh, the reconstruction project, the local match responsibility for the levy reconstruction project. Do we have a, how much have we acquired in that fund for the match? So at this point in time, uh, the, the match requirement that's requested by the Corps varies um, depending on uh, what their needs are. We're required to keep in pace with their level of effort on the reconstruction project, mm -hmm. and that's what we continue to do. Um, we are carrying um, a, a balance forward that will help meet that obligation as well as the obligations that are required of us to maintain the, the existing facility. So, so do you think that by increasing this, we're going to have enough for the match? So increasing, uh, making the recommendation to increase our benefit assessment rates by CPI is just going to allow us to keep pace with market forces that, that affect our ability to contract, affect our drainage crews to do the work that they do in maintaining the facilities. So we will need to come up with additional funding eventually here. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I do too. <clears throat> okay, benefit assessment. That comes down to uh, the people paying the fee expect uh, some kind of benefit. Uh, we're talking about a lot of projects going on right now. If, if, if the projects don't go through, then there's no benefit. Is that, am I correct? So there are ongoing uh, benefits realized through the constant work of our drainage crews uh, to maintain the facilities, to ensure that adequate flows can pass down through the Pajaro River in the existing federal facility, and to address concerns from members of the public on uh, drainage ways in Zone 7 that they're responsible for maintaining. Um, it also allows us to do the work here back in the office to support um, the ongoing needs for a levy reconstruction project and to get that project uh, moved out of the feasibility phase and into design and construction. Okay, and uh, my last chance to commend all of, all of the work that you are and your staff are doing and my concern over 
uh, we've got a good team, and uh, if we keep changing the team, uh, we could go the way of the 49ers. So I, I don't want to. I want to. I don't want to see that happen. I, I want people to all work together, keep this team going, and uh, I want to support all of you in the work you're doing. I'm, I'm very concerned about that right now. Thank uh, you, Supervisor Caput, if I may. Um, when Bruce Leclerc left, we knew there'd be a huge vacuum and huge shoes to fill in, in keeping this project moving forward. And when John uh, Presley and I were looking for his replacement, that's exactly what we had in mind. We did find that in Mark Stradley, the flood control that's manager right. I have here today. And he's done an exemplary job of getting up to speed and getting to DC and talking to those that need to be spoken to. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that this project will not skip a beat uh, due to the fault of the county or the city of Watsonville moving forward. And, and uh, he is very capable. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. All right. So there's a motion for the recommended actions from uh, Director Bilsich, second by Director Caput. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you all. That's the zone seven. The Board of Supervisors still has two additional items before we go into closed session, but we will end Zone 7. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item on the regular agenda for the Board of Supervisors is item 47, which is to consider ordinances amending Santa Cruz County Code Sections 3.12040 and 2.16030 to exempt the personnel director and county budget manager positions from civil service status and incorporate an advisory panel process for recruitment purposes and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the interim personnel director. Ms. Patel, you have a presentation for us? Brief, yes. Good afternoon, Chair Friend and members of the board. We have three items for your consideration today, two of which are related to the personnel director position. In January, the Civil Service Commission approved a staff recommendation to remove the personnel director position from the civil service system in order to maintain parity amongst the key leadership positions in our organization. A four-fifths vote is required by your board to approve this action. And if your board approves the commission's actions, corresponding changes are required to amend the recruitment and examination process for this position to an advisory process which is more consistent with the civil service status and the last item for your consideration this morning is to extend the non civil service exemption to the county budget manager position this position was previously exempt under its old title of deputy county administrative officer that concludes my comments and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have Thank you. As a note, this action requires a four-fifths majority vote of the board to pass. Are there any questions of the board before we open it up to the community? We'll open it up for the community. Is there anybody who'd like to address us on this item? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, Becky Steinbrunner. As I read through this, what struck me is that it reduces really the importance and um, engagement of the Civil Service Commission in this process and, and changes them to an advisory board rather than the more active position that they have had, as I understand it. So I think that's uh, not necessarily a good thing. Um, I attend as many commission uh, meetings in various areas as I can, and what they are always told is they really have no power because they are only an advisory body. And that really sort of takes the wind out of their sails. I've seen it over and over again. So um, I just want to make that comment and advise you to keep this commission actively involved in the selection of these p uh, positions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to direct a uh, comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I think this is a really good action. I appreciate your efforts. I'll move approval. Uh, I'll, I'll second, and I think this is keeping in, in what we've been doing over the last couple of months around uh, the direct reports uh, of our department directors and others. So I, th I support this action. Motion from Coonerty, second uh, from Leopold. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. The final item on the regular agenda is 47.1, which is to consider appointment of Dustin uh, Vericker to the Workforce Development Board as a local business representative for a term to expire June 30th of 2022. Are there any questions from board members? I would move approval. Second. We have a motion from Leopold and a second from Coonerty. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this appointment? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. The board will go into closed session. Is there anything reportable out of closed session? No. All right, then we are. The regular meeting is adjourned and we'll go into closed session. Thank you to Community TV and the Sentinel for covering today.